good evening. It is Wednesday, December 12th, uh, 2018. This is the Fort River School Building Committee. Um, and we are meeting at the police station uh, the community room. And this uh, meeting is being recorded by Embers Media. Um, and uh, we're going to dive right into our agenda. Um, uh, we can call to order. Uh, approved minutes from last meeting. Unfortunately, we do not have the minutes available to circulate to approve, so we will have to move past that one. Um, but I, I guess I could pause and ask if I could have a volunteer to record at least one of the two meetings. That, well, I, you've already volunteered to do the last one. Yeah, you, yeah. And so. I don't mind trying to do tonight's um, if someone would volunteer to record minutes from the other one that's unrecorded. But we have video, so. We have video. It would have to be done from, from the video. And, and I'm sure we can probably patch together notes that we've all kind of taken. But I think the best place to start is with the recording um, and circulate a draft based on that. And we can gather comments. It's a short meeting, I think. It is a short meeting. I, I can do that one. OK. What, what's the date on the one? I think that's, well, Just email me I will email you. I'll find it live with yeah. um, So we can, uh, I think, move, since we don't have to vote on anything, uh, under minutes, move to public comments. Um, and uh, we have some folks here, and I don't know if everyone would like to speak or, or if anyone would like to speak, but I'll ask, does someone want to speak? Mr. Riddle. <laughs> um, Chris Riddle, uh, Precinct 2. Uh, uh, I, I just, I said, Jonathan and I have talked a little bit. I understand from, the, the, more or less from the grapevine that it's necessary that the designs that we are seeing for the uh, all new project, the new all construct, uh, the uh, no renovation all new project requires uh, photovoltaics over parking lots and fields. And I find that, I just, my comment is that I find that surprising. Um, it would seem like, uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm from the projects that I'm familiar with, it's possible in a two-story building, usually, to get at least the lion's share of the PV on the, on the roof. And so I would be interested to know what the EUI, the energy use intensity of the proposed building is that goes along with the need for PV on the uh, parking lots and in the fields. That's a question. I, I, if I haven't viewed the, the draft, I think that will hopefully get addressed tonight. When our designers arrive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do the designers know that it's they do. five? Yes. <laughs> um, it is. I I I, I, meet him, I had several conversations with okay, him this no, week. I, I, I believe yeah, in my heart. It could be a traffic slowdown yeah. in the yeah. moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. The usual one. Yeah. As opposed to the usual ones. Yeah. Um, I believe it's October twenty-five. Okay. Uh, that's uh, other uh, comments from the public? Not hearing any. I'm going to move on. Um, our, our next topic is, uh, at least on the agenda as we have it right now, would be for the, our designers to uh, give us an update, which today will include uh, uh, permanent cost information. Um, but we will move uh, to the next item and come back as needed. Um, the, well, actually, what I'd really like to do is move to the an item after that, because I think, Anthony, you could probably uh, update us on what, what's happening with both Geotech and Survey, um, and then maybe we can have a little conversation about the previous item. Okay. So um, on the survey, the field work is done. Uh, Virtue Design says that uh, they're halfway, about 50%, done with drafting. Uh, that's where we stand right now. That's about all there is on that. Uh, we went to Geotech. Yep. Um, well, can I ask, uh, did, did they give an ETA? Uh, they did not. Our, our contract by rights ends at the end of the year. Um, hopefully, the, keep that timeline. But the, the interesting thing to, thing to note is, I believe they are in fact the site designer that TSKP is using, and so they certainly should have the information in house that they need to give input to TSKP. But we still need the survey <laughs> as an object, as a as a document. So. Uh, on Geotech, uh, I emailed before the meeting that uh, we solicited nine companies, received three responses. 
they are in decreasing cost. McPhail Associates at fourteen thousand nine seventy four. ENCB Consulting at nine thousand seven hundred, and O'Reilly, Talbot, and Okun at nine thousand even. Um, I don't believe there's anything in the proposal that would preclude us from awarding them as the apparent successful bidder. But uh, I don't know if anyone else had anything on that. No, the nine thousand is, is, is just a little bit under our budget, which is which is great. Do we need to vote on that for? Uh, I I mean I have no choice but to award them under the law, but true. we can probably vote for it. Sure. <laughs> okay, I guess we. Any discussion? But yeah, I guess yeah. this is going to be a discussion. Doesn't hurt the vote. So, all in favor of accepting that proposal? All right, so I will uh, draw the contract, send it to them in the morning, and uh, hopefully have them working as soon as possible. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I, put my head down. Um, I think j just so the public knows, I yep. believe in their. Um, what application bid, whatever it's called. I think they indicated that the work would, they were anticipating would be completed by January 31st. Do I have that right or not? Uh, yes, that is, what, that is what okay. that's what they say. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that report and forings or just the paper? It seemed that. Uh, I'm, you know, okay. I, I would read it. It says the work and the proposal. So yeah, I would, yeah. I would never include like mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, actually, I can give a brief report on committee membership. Um, and, and then maybe others know more than I do. But um, as far as I know, the town council is not taking up the issue of, of confirming um, appointments. But Anthony? So I talked to the town clerk's office yeah. today. Uh, they said that there is no impediment to appointing new members to committees now. Okay. Um, but they will need an appointment letter for Ben Harrington or, or anyone else from the authority, from the appointing authority. That's <laughs> which it, which is, is us, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I think so. Um, I still got the impression from. My last correspondence with, with the town manager that that any appointments we suggest have to be confirmed by the town council, um, and his and that was as of the end of September, um, and that uh, that folks had also had to fill out the town's volunteer um, uh, form, which is what I've counseled both Ben and uh, uh, Rudy Perkins, who has also put his name forward as, as potentially filling a slot um, to do. Uh, but if we should write a letter, if another letter. I mean, I mean, this uh, appears to be. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this appears to be our open question: is who yeah. is the appointing authority? To, because we were constituted by the school right. committee, not the, not select board or town council, and then the school committee devolved that authority to us. If the, I mean, uh, if nobody will appoint it unless town council gives a say so, then I guess that's the way it is. So right. That seems strange to me. I would go with the town clerk's suggestion. I mean, if, the, if there's a hiccup, then we can go through the other one. But the clerk is saying there's no impediment. We should go ahead and appoint. If this feels like a circle because uh, unfortunately that, that's where I started many, many six months ago. But and now, I, say, now yeah. she's, they're saying it's okay. Look, we need well, perhaps this time they will give me the form, the, the form work for the letter because I couldn't get past that point at, at a certain point. But yes, we'll follow that. Path so um, uh, the it was the March 2018 meeting of the Amherst School Committee where they said that we have the authority to fill our own vacancies. Yeah. So um, how, um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we send a letter from the committee on <coughs> and just you know have it maybe yeah. not be for me but just draft a letter. Yeah. Um, and. If, if nobody has objections to yeah. you doing that and sending it on, you know, with our, on our behalf or getting an electronic signature right. or something like that, um, I would send it to the town clerk and with the, with the, the suggested names. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Worst thing that happens is right. Worst thing that happens is they then have to fill out a 
committee volunteer form. They already have. Yeah, I, mean, I think. Well, what I just mean, before you push the yeah. paperwork, right? right? The worst thing happens is then, oh, sorry, that's not going to work. We'll have to take a bit of paperwork. Right. Can't hurt. <laughs> that's what we'll do. Do we need to talk about? We, I mean, we've talked about Ben, but not. Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, yeah. So, uh, did everyone get? I want. Hey, I think it went to everybody. But if, I assume everyone got the the um, note from Reed Perkins. Mm -hmm. um, who, at least from reading the email, was on the group that helped form the bylaw, which was, I think, very helpful to our group to understand how we should apply it to this project or not this project, to our feasibility study. Um, personally, I'd be in favor of, of having them on board. They bring a good perspective. The net zero bylaw. Just yeah, to sorry, the net zero bylaw. Others have thoughts? Should we have a formal? Motion. I think we've had one for Ben, so we could, we could probably do the same thing for uh, for for Rudy. Um, I guess I'd, I'd ask can someone make a motion to whatever we're going to call it. Um, to a point. A point. There's the right word. <coughs> Rudy Perkins uh, to the currently open slot for a green energy um, expert. So move. Move to appoint Rudy Perkins to the Green Energy Expert <laughs> slot on the Fort River School Building Committee. Second. All in favor? There we go. <laughs> um, okay. So that was committee membership. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, meeting minute taking, and I'll, I will try to to record tonight's, um, and I'm sure I'll be using that recording <laughs> to help me out. Um, let's since TSKP is not here. Let's, let's go back to uh, public outreach. <coughs> something, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. something. Well, yeah. just moving forward, are we going to try to do internally meeting minutes from here on out? I would like to try it for a little while. It's, we have, we've had a hard time picking <coughs> someone that if we can, we can, you know, achieve a rhythm with self-volunteerism, um, at least we'll know. <laughs> that we've got something as opposed to having to work backwards. I don't know. I don't know what other people think. Uh, I, I mean, I was, I guess we all, <laughs> I, I didn't, wasn't really high on hiring someone in the first place, but at the time of year we're dealing with them right now, it's going to be, uh, like, what, six weeks? Right. That's the fastest. How much longer is this committee yeah. around? Not too much longer after that. <coughs> no. By the spring we'll be done. So I, I, think, I think we can take on that task ourselves. Other thoughts or questions? Okay. <laughs> do we do invoices? Uh, I don't know. Do we have any? Do we, we have, have, yeah, yeah, have yeah. invoices yeah. too? Okay. Let's take it. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> Super productive meeting, by the way. <laughs> if they ever show up. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope they do. I hope something, you know, I didn't check the think email right before I walked over here. I hope that, you know, there wasn't a traffic accident or something. But, um, do folks have questions on their current invoice? So, Anthony, do you want to preface this with, with that? Um, it's uh, invoice number two for $15,000, bringing us to $90,000 total. Um, that note at the bottom that says still outstanding, I that's my handwritten note about that we did in fact cut a check for that. They probably just hadn't received it when they printed invoice two. But uh, I have no you know, other comments on it. Questions? Move. Okay. Move to approve the invoice for TSPB for fifteen thousand dollars. Second. All in favor? Motion passes. of actually being able to talk a little bit about public outreach and while we would also like to have TSKP's kind of input on, on their part of it, um, I think this gives us an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about you know, the schedule of when that can happen, um, maybe the, the nature of it. I'm also thinking since we've had a hard time having enough time to talk about this that at least we could talk about whether or not we want it. At one point we had a, a working group um, which kind of talked, was tasked with, with outreach, um, whether we should, that group should meet again, could be another thing to talk about. I don't know who would like to start this topic after I ramble on a bit. 
I can start. I think I asked you, did you manage, I asked you to ask uh, TSKP a little bit about what they have been doing in other places, what kind of format. I think we can discuss a lot, but if they don't, they yeah, they're they going to be do. a very big part of whatever it is we do. So they have to be part of the conversation. I think we cannot make all the decisions without having consulted with them. I mean, I think what I can say so far is we can kind of think of, to some degree, what they do with us, but, but more pointedly, the, the joint meeting we have with the school committee is, is a kind of a taste of, of part of what that, that would be like. There, there would be a big piece of it that would be kind of a presentation of, of you know, the progress to date. Um, but I think there would also be a, you know, that that was more a contained thing. It wasn't kind of that back and forth with, with the public that, that would be part of that. Mike? Just I think one thing to be always aware of, like even in these meetings, or the school committee is a great example, is just there's so much information to share. And what's the balance between sharing information so that people can give authentic feedback and giving people an opportunity to offer that feedback? And, you know, I know there are case of things to say about that, but I think that's always a challenge, you know, how can you offer the feedback until you understand, like, you know, even the public comment we see tonight? It's a really good question, but there has to be some exchange. And so I guess the question is how much we want presentation, how much we want given back and forth and questions, and then dialogue, and what's the, you know, maybe one thing that we could talk about is what's the feasibility committee's role during those? Is it, is it really a lay observer, and, and it's really for the public to interact with the architects, or is there a larger role that the committee wants to play in that relationship? Question. Make two sense. Mr. Some notes so we have fun talk, talking and writing at the same time. I think. Go ahead. Sorry. I think I agree about the information. I think if we go and present everything at once, people won't have time to digest. I think we have the advantage that we have been posting almost all the documents online. Yep. So when the forum is announced, it should be announced with the link or the reference to the web page, so if people are very interested, they can go and look at almost up-to-date information that we have, um, so that they can come up with more questions if they have. Besides lo looking and interacting with them, you can have, you can take a look at the documents before coming, so that the first time you see is there. But it also does kind of make you wonder if, it, are there really two <laughs> sessions where one is more informational and people have time to absorb it? But then, is it really the same group that comes back the next time? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's just a, a thought, not a, a suggestion. I think it has to be one, okay. because if two people will come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Asking too much time, um, I think it has to be one, and we time to digest. someone else jumping in, I don't mean to talk about the conversation, but I think also just understanding that the public who comes are going to have really different ranges. I agree with everything I said. We're going to have really different ranges of experience. Some people who are in the field, some people who won't look at the website because for whatever reason they won't be able to interpret it because they don't come from this background. And I think that's also one of the challenges, how to right fit a presentation and education ease, how to, how to differentiate the, the program so that if you're someone who's been attending these meetings and is in the field, you have access and can share it, but also someone who comes in who hasn't looked at one thing but cares deeply about the schools right. can come in and also get enough information where they can ask questions. And, and that's a real challenge. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a clear place where we're going to be looking for a little bit of guidance on CSKB on, on the right way to do that, because this, this should not be the first one they've ever done, and we know it's not. Um, we're in. Um, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, I think maybe because we need the we need TSKP for content, maybe we can talk a little bit about timing yeah. and mm -hmm. and um, and format. And do we want to do a big presentation? Do we do want to do it a couple different times a day? Do we want to have we we've talked about also doing something like office hours to have um, to make ourselves available for one on one conversation, so it's not in a big forum. I mean, I I like that idea. Um, um, and if we do a large presentation. Uh, to be mindful to maybe have it in town um, to be more accessible. I, I think having it in an accessible location uh, is, is critical to want to reach as many people as we can. Yeah. Um, and and I'm going to throw out maybe I, it, asking to have a s slot on the very crowded and uh, lettered town council <laughs> agenda to make a presentation there. That's a question. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, let's let's step back and look at and think about the, the, the broad time piece. Um, my guess is that the school committee would probably like us to come back and have another joint session at some point, mm -hmm. and it probably makes sense to have that public outreach after that, so that the school committee kind of gets to hear what we've been hearing. Um, is that a fair guesstimate of what your colleagues might might wish? That's yeah, I think I think it's spot. fair. I, th I think that um, uh, my guess is the next time we would want to hear is after these cost estimates have been further refined or the sort of the analysis is further refined in whatever way it's going to be. And then prior to a draft report being sort of put to bed so that yeah. there's a there's a level of opportunity to both hear um, you know numbers and an analysis that it seems at that point pretty solid. But also is <coughs> early enough, just early enough that if some, this, I think this would be true for the public too, yeah. that, if there were, that if there were questions that came up that helped frame or improve the framing of the final deliverable, that the, public's that the public and the school committee <coughs> both have an opportunity to weigh in at a point where they can have an impact on that. Meaning if there's a question that could be answered better or have, wasn't well answered um, or wasn't considered to be highlighted for some, for whatever reason, um, it came at a point in the process where uh, they could they could hear that feedback. We could hear that feedback and say, "Gosh, you know, that made a lot of sense." And it could really impact the draft. Make sense? I, I would agree. Yes. And I would like to really make that really explicit. Exactly that point that kind of the the deliverable at the end of this process is not a building. You know, it's not. So when we're going to the public, what we're asking of them is not your vote for this or your, you know, it's like we want to produce a document that helps this town make a decision, start, that's helpful for us as we move forward in decision making about how to address these things. And so we're asking the public, we need your feedback on this document that we're producing. And I think, you know, and I think that's maybe where our role comes in or, or we delegate that, but to, to the architects, but making sure we, um, you know, the committee's work has been very narrow and specific, um, but it's in this context of a bunch of stuff that is incredibly not narrow and specific. It's, there couldn't be any more moving pieces in trying to solve this puzzle. And so when we, you know, having the public understand what the work product is of this committee will help get us feedback that I think is relevant to what the committee can do with it. And I, unless, I mean, we see our role in this committee as starting starting that bigger conversation, and I don't think it is. Um, so I think when we enter these meetings with the public, being very explicit about, this is what we're gonna do with this feedback, we're gonna refine our document, then we will have, that will be something that lives as something that will help inform this next conversation that we're gonna have. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that, that we're not, we're not framing, we're not going to guide that conversation. We're providing information to that conversation um, for the school committee, for the public, for the town council. We want to hear back, I think, and we want the designers to hear, are we have, do we have the right information? Do are we including the right information? Sure. And that's where, that's where I don't, I don't mind people uh, coming, let me rephrase this, I like the fact that members of the public are going to come in with their own lens. Uh, that doesn't bother me at all because in the end, the strength of the study is in if somebody is all in, uh, not just for, let's say for compliance with the net zero bylaw, but actually having net zero building, um, do they feel like this report provides a fair or reasonable analysis of what that looks like on this site? Right. Regardless of, you know, and I, I suppose it'd be true if you were skeptical of that, that you'd say was this also a fair and reasonable analysis in the sense that it wasn't, you know, the, the information is good information, the analysis is good information. Uh, I mean, as the question came up earlier, um, what goes into deciding um, how much uh, PV is necessary for this site, how much of it can be on the roof, how much of it has to be in the field, what, are, what other alternatives are there? I mean, my point is somebody who's going to be looking at this, and this is true also. If you go A through E, 
any of those options, somebody may have walk in with a cognitive lens that says, I prefer, I think this is the right kind of answer. Then they read through it, let me understand this better. I'm hoping that not only they get really useful information, but that, that somebody sees value and good analytical depth of information in each of these alternatives doesn't feel gained for an outcome, right. which seems in terms of how it's framed out. I think that's a pretty good argument for maybe having an earlier session, the earlier presentation to the public to get some input. Because if we wait until after we done another presentation and gone through a cycle with the school committee, we've already gone down a path and, we, and, mm -hmm. and we're missing the opportunity to f have input from members of the public who don't happen to be at this table or, or in our audience mm -hmm. now. So maybe it make, and I think we did schedule, Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, did we have, a, did we have yeah. two pub large public presentation opportunities? Yes. And maybe we need to be thinking about doing something earlier, even before we've completed our next bunch of work. I think we, or the, now I'm talking personally, I think I would like to make sure I'm really comfortable with where they have the numbers. I don't feel like they have to be done done, but I, I don't, I'd hate to go before the public and feel unconfident about what they're presenting to the public. That, that's the only caveat I would, I would slide in there. That, that, by the way, was what I meant. I actually didn't, I'm not, I mean, I, this is where I can't speak for the committee. Yeah. I don't actually think there's any particular value and having the school committee hear this before the public, yeah. if the point of the exercise is as we just described it, right. I mean, I, don't, I really, I just really don't. Um, what I strongly believe is that, not that everything has to be locked down, but that, but it would be deaf to go before the public and someone saying, well, how do you understand how these numbers were arrived at? And your answer is, well, we're figuring that out. I mean, I know that's making that up. It's unfair, it's like a bad straw man. My point is that if we're figuring it out, then that's like a bad answer for us, right? We have to just farther along than that, that what we're presenting is we feel pretty comfortable with. Which I think is what you were saying. Uh, but it feels like we're on the same page. So, so kind of with that in mind, I can imagine, <laughs> depending on, on you know how, how we kind of we're able to absorb the information we get tonight so they arrive. Because <laughs> I'm getting more nervous by the minute. Do you have a phone number by the way? I don't know if I have anybody's uh, cell I phone. I got an idea. I don't want to make a motion. Uh, okay. After this meeting, when you get in touch with the consultants, that we get, get a, a cell Get a couple of cell numbers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I'm, I'm feeling that that should have occurred to No, I'm not, I'm not being critical. I'm just being like, because right now the biggest thing is they there may be a really excellent reason why they're never going to arrive tonight. And yeah. It would be great to know that. I, I actually, I bet they're going to arrive at 6, and I think the meeting's at 6. You that's think that's, I, that's it, I, think. I mean, it's, it is possible, I was, I but. I have been thinking 5.30, but not anymore. I, I, I know I made it as clear as I could be, but, you know, I've also been on the other side of the seat and yeah. said, oh, yeah, 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 I, I, I heard you say 5, except I heard you say 6. <laughs> no. We have the phone numbers of the office. Yeah. We, we could ask someone to step out. Well, yeah, we, could, we, we could recess. Yeah, I we could, could recess. I, and I try Mike, Mike I'm happy it. to do it. Yeah, Mike could do it. I mean, I have could, yeah, if you could try to do that. Yeah. I have this feeling that they 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 kind of work public school hours because they work a lot of public schools, and right, so the receptionist is probably like left. Um, but if we can give it a try, it doesn't matter. Regarding timing, uh, Heather, you mentioned that soon, but I don't think it would be able to happen before university starts on mid-January, I don't think, considering um, that we don't know when yeah. we are meeting again and how, how long it would take to refine numbers or if they have to refine numbers, I would not be confident that we can do it before January 15th. Yeah, I don't think we could pick a. I don't think we could successfully pick a date tonight. Um, but if we could manage to meet early, early-ish in January, um, I still still think I'm hoping we could have a date towards the end of January. Um, I don't know. That's just literally spitballing something. That that's why I was kind of wondering if it wouldn't make sense for a, a working group of us to get together to kind of sort out some possible dates. Um, just so that this piece maybe could still be happening despite um, a gap in our meetings. 
like it's helpful to know the schedules right now. Amherst school committee meetings in the winter. Once there's one in January, which is the 22nd, and then the other one because of the winter recess is the 26th of February. So you got kind of a pretty big window between those two dates. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it before, but just that would be helpful to know when the yeah. scheduled school committee meetings actually are. And there's no more until then. Is that right? Is oh no, there's a meeting there's a on Tuesday of next okay. week. I'm sorry, I, I was looking at okay. yeah, months, but you know. That's just the Amherst and then is that regional too? Those are, I just mentioned the Amherst school committee meetings. Okay. I'm sorry. No, there's, there's a bunch of regional meetings. The regional ones are awesome, but they're sacred. <laughs> and super early, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. We were at it last night, so it's in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that something we can <laughs> avoid too, though? I mean, like, what are the big things oh. we need to avoid when scheduling? So, school committee meetings, obviously. That's a really good question. Um, school, school, school events. School <laughs> events. So, we've got the school calendar for that. Town council meetings, potentially. Yeah. Um, boy, that's a. That's, that's a that's a thorny question. I mean, that's again another reason to maybe schedule a group to you know sit down with the town and school calendars and just <laughs> see what's left in January, February. Yeah, the working group. That I think they most. It sounds like they're meeting mostly on Mondays, which I think otherwise are not great nights for 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 kind of public outreach. If we're generally agreed as a group that we, I mean, a we see a value in doing forum. Yeah. Or I mean, two, but one sooner rather than later. We generally agree with the concept of it. We generally agree that we that as soon as we feel comfortable that um, we're comfortable with hearing for the numbers, we think it'd be valuable to do that exercise. Then I think it'd be great to just decide we would like to have a working group get together recently with you, uh, Jonathan, to try to find the right date and yeah. knock down a date because yeah. we need to do it. Yeah, because it's not one of these things where we're going to posting an agenda two days ahead and expect anyone to show up. Right, you know, we need to make noise, <laughs> get publicity out. Yeah, so That's setting the date. So I could see this, the working group working on setting a date, coming up with an advertising strategy, which I don't know, maybe it is just this, this for the working group to figure out. Um, what else would that working group need to work on? Uh, Security secure venue. Yeah, yeah. Secure yeah. Venue. yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Date, advertising, and venue. Like, so just um, you know, I don't need to be in the working group necessarily, but just you know, if the venue stuff like that's something I'd be helpful with. The other thing to note is that there's a group, a board that's studying regionalization between the towns of Amherst and the town of Pelham, and they're also looking at engagement, probably not on a wildly different schedule than what mm -hmm. this group is. So I also sort of can interface between the two groups to make sure that we're not picking the same night. Because <laughs> right, that could happen. Yeah. Right, um, and they don't, they haven't picked dates, um, but I think they're getting closer. Right to that, um, but I just wouldn't want to, or even if it was the night after, right? Even if it's two nights in a row, that might be. It's possible there'd be someone who one was interested both in both, and, and, yeah. you know. So maybe that some of that's unavoidable. There's not that many days in the winter, right? We'll start running out, but just another one to be cautious about, particularly looking at elementary families, in, in a similar way that I think this will draw a lot of them, elementary and school families. <coughs> Anybody, working group. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens, Mike. <laughs> or at least we'd be, we'd be in communication with you. No, no, no. I, I think it makes logical sense. I, I certainly don't mind. Some of the uh, technical, serving. logistical parts, I have more ready access than others. Yeah. yeah. Happy to do it. I, I don't mind serving on that. Yeah. Do we need more than two people? Um, I yeah, I mean, it'd be good to just to have a third or a third body to help out yeah. with logistics. Sounds good. Yeah. By the way, it's super productive. Just want to point that out. We're getting <laughs> I, I, a lot I, of things. I, this is very cathartic. I, <laughs> this is the first time we really had a chance to talk about anything in depth. It's important to be a firm. <laughs> yes. So I just I did pull up our um, community out, um, outreach outline, which you know talked about how we have a website and we have an email address and library binder and all that stuff, um, which all that stuff is held true pretty good. And we've been doing the press release as well. So what we put down for public forums is we said we were going to do three of them total. Um, and you know this was always you know the big headline at the top of this thing was like we're going to revise this as we go along. Like, um, and um, so I'll read what it said here. And then we had also had during you know a public meeting talking with the architects, which didn't agree with 
this either. Yeah. So we said we were going to have three total, one at each of the following milestones. Preliminary options development, refined options with cost estimates, and then after the final report. Each forum will explain where we are in the process of the feasibility study and solicit feedback from the public. Feedback can be gathered at the event <coughs> and gathered through the committee's email address. Each forum will be recorded by Amherst Media and be available for viewing through the committee's website. Um, we said the desired locations would be the town room and town hall. Um, we said the timing, would, we would target weekday evenings, and we would advertise through press releases and flyers at Amherst Three Libraries. So that's where we were at when we drafted that thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we should update this yes. when we um, settle it. So we missed the preliminary options development. Yep. Um, so, but I still think the two still make sense, the final two. Um, Although maybe, I, I guess we should talk about whether or not we want to have that final one after the final draft, or do we want to have it right before? I don't know. I think, they keep it to three I think it's going to be too close together at this point. To Perhaps. The budget, I think afterwards to present the final. The final findings, I guess, yes. The final findings, okay. otherwise there won't be. I have a question. I think that um, when we did our RFP for the architects, didn't we specify how many we wanted? We should probably go back and look yeah. at that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it was any fewer than two, though. No. 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 So, I, mean, I, I don't think so either, but I think, think that, that that since that's what we've contracted with them for, we should probably go back and look oh, and yeah. see. Yeah. yeah <laughs> So they won't be, I think it's better to present the final results because if not, people are going to stay waiting. Oh, where's, where's the final? Yeah. I think um, when we talked to the architect about doing it, I think we were talking about two. Um, and I don't remember what was in the um, RFP, but we had talked about doing one about with the cost estimates about now. Um, and then, because um, they were sort of talking about we'll just do one, and I said, we really need to give the we really need to go back to the public one more time to say, did we hear you right? Um, and I feel like that's basically in the final report zone. And I feel like we could have basically do the final presentation, but maybe not have the final final report written. So the work product at the very end could still incorporate any final comments that come out of the last presentation, I think. Right, because it, 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 truth isn't final until we deliver it to the school. Yeah. <laughs> or, there could yes. be, or there could be an appendix right. or something that we add, yeah. you know, final right. feedback. You know, if we wanted to have kind of a final report to at least present, it could be that plus like a, a final draft. Comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, that's a bad idea. It's a good idea. Well, other comments, questions on. on Outreach. We can email amongst ourselves on yeah. when we can find the time to get together. So, what people agreed to have a tentative date at the end of the last week of January or before the last week of January, so so that we have a target. So we start yeah. looking in that week, and if not, we're gonna go randomly looking. So if we say the week of Martin Luther King uh, is the week that university starts, so yeah. I don't know. Some people might be tuned to that. Um, why don't we say we're going to, I'm going to propose that we'll, we'll initially target the end of January, leave it a little bit looser, okay. and we'll meet as a group and see what we can come up with. Hey, good timing. <laughs> we got a lot done before you <laughs> got here. Are we ready? Well, uh, yes. depends yes. On, <laughs> on when you thought you were supposed to be here. Yes, so that they set up? Yes, I, so I, I guess we can we move to have a, uh, whatever we call it, a brief pause, a recess. Brief pause. All in favor? How long are we recessing for? Uh, let's call Until it, uh, yeah, five or ten minutes, whatever it takes them. If, if folks want to use the restroom for anything, I think we the restroom. Yeah, you can follow completely the bouncing ball of uh, this week. So, in a, in a, you're ready? Okay. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. So, 
we're, we're calling this meeting no, okay. back into session from our, our mini recess. Um, we are, are now going to turn to the topic of uh, the um, presentation uh, by our the architects, the SKP. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to preface this slightly uh, before turning it over to you all, just to say this is our first <coughs> conversation around uh, costs. I'm sure we'll have several more. Um, and if you can, before you dive in too much, it might be good if you could give us a little co context about what what is most helpful to you to hear tonight about what, what you're presenting. Um, or at least, if you don't start with that, slip it in there somewhere so we can sure. make sure we give you the, the best fine. feedback um, we can. Well, as you know, um, we've been developing these options with you and we've taken them now to our estimator. Um, and so we have a lot of feedback which we're going to share tonight. And I think, I think what's most helpful to us is to um, confirm that the way we've seen the project, the way we've been thinking about it, is consistent with the way that you want us to think about the project. Yeah. Um, so it's the scope of the project. And up to a great extent, we've defined that in our sketches as we've spoken with you about these various options. Um, but there may be some areas where that's not been fully defined, and, and uh, it may have lived in our narratives, uh, which we shared with you prior to going to the estimator. But you know, I think you've had a chance to digest over time. Um, so, It'll be helpful, I think, to look at the numbers and react to that. Um, and, and certainly we've had those those narratives. We've never had the opportunity to kind of talk about them. Sure. And so it is possible there are going to be questions tonight that, that may be informed by the narratives. Um, and so you may have to pull on, on, on some of that sure. to, to give us context. I think we can do that. Um, so maybe we should start going through yep. the presentation. Yeah. Um, so we'll use this one too. I think if people have a really pressing question on the, a, a slide that's in front of them, they can feel free to, to ask it. But as much as possible, let let them kind of walk us through it, and then we can come back to stuff if, we need to. if that if that, if that seems fair. So. Okay. Um, so this kind of is responding to what you just asked. What are yeah. our goals? And so we just want to review what we went through uh, in terms of budgeting uh, and phasing. We have phasing as part of this presentation as well. Um, and present the, the budget options, which relate to other design options. And then the assumption is what I was getting at. What is the, what is the scope of this project? And we want to make sure that we are thinking the same thing. Um, as I mentioned, we work with an independent estimator, and we've shared with you um, the report that they created out of the options that we provided in our pricing narrative. Um, this is page one of the report. It, it shows um, options A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then the enrollment um, variations on those options, which is A, A, A1, A2, A3 for each letter. Um, it also talks a little bit about how you might procure this project, whether you would go CM at risk or um, design bid build uh, with a GC. Um, and I can tell you that the numbers we've worked with um, in, uh, in the rest of the presentation are the CM at risk numbers, which are higher in this case. Is um, that, I mean, I can now I'm going to interrupt this real quick. Is that, is that because that's what the MSBA would typically no, recommend? No, okay. the MSBA was providing an extra reimbursement incentive point to okay. use CM at risk, but they've now stopped doing that. Okay. Um, and there, there are some advantages to CM at risk when we get into a phase renovation. Uh, having one person that can think through all that phasing in a way that's amenable to, to your needs as you're operating the building is a, probably a real advantage. But when we get to option A and B, which are well, A in particular, being a new building, I think you could look at the design bid build option, and that would probably work pretty well. Um, but to be apples to apples at this point, we did everything seem at risk. Um, um, this is the second page, I believe, or you'll find this in the estimator package as well. Um, just wanted to go through somewhat briefly um, this reoccurring page. This happens for each of the six options. And you'll see that the costs for the project are, are broken down 
Um, the estimator has worked with our areas for new construction and demolition, which is on our sketches, uh, as well as our PV panel areas, uh, which are itemized there in the top column. Um, and so, and, and, and some site assumptions, which we can, we can talk through, as well as hazardous waste removal. Uh, so all of that stuff added together is your total direct cost. Um, that's not your construction cost yet. Um, to get to construction costs, we need to consider contingencies, design contingency, construction contingency, escalation. We're not building this right now. We're looking ahead. Uh, we've carried till um, bid at the fall of 2020. Um, is, is we weren't quite sure where to put that, but we <coughs> put it out a few years. Um, and we've carried that the same through all the options. <coughs> um, and everything I've mentioned so far in terms of um, after direct costs, the contingencies are all the same for all the options. Uh, for general conditions, we have a 24-month schedule for all the A options. They're all new buildings. And when we talk about phasing later, you can see that we adjust the um, construction duration according to our analysis of phasing. Um, so that does change between the options according to how long we think construction duration will be. Um, and then there's um, permit, bond, general requirements. These are in profit. These are all going to be the same <coughs> for all the options. Um, so they, those need to be added in to get to construction cost, um, which is um, towards the bottom in the black rectangle. Um, and then there's a cost per square foot divided out, which you had asked for, for construction costs. Now that, that has the site in it. Um, so that's your overall total construction cost per square foot. Um, and then you can see at the bottom, there are the five HVAC <coughs> options, which we also priced. Um, and the way those work is they're in addition to the base option, which is option six. We had understood that, um, well, after we had presented the HVAC options, um, we had some feedback saying option six might be the, the um, most familiar to the town in terms of maintenance. Um, it also happens to be the least expensive, so it worked well, so that all the other options are a little bit more than option six. Some are, some are significantly more. And so we've, in our matrix, which is coming up, we've um, <coughs> built in the cost for the HVAC options. And so here's our matrix of all of the pricing feedback we've received. Um, a little truncated here, but you can see um, option A, B, C, D, E, and F. We've gone through this before. The different enrollments are four columns under each letter. Um, as you recall, those enrollments are the, um, the 465, which is um, your K through 6 school at 420 students plus a pre K of 45 students. The 420 is just a K through 6 school at 420 students. 360 is your existing school population plus a pre-K program for 45 students, and 315 is the existing school population. So we had looked at all those, and then we also looked at six HVAC options. But I, I put in yellow, <coughs> the yellow boxes represent the ones we actually drew. Because as you know, you've seen drawings of one option A. Um, and on that drawing, you'll notice it'll point out well, here's the pre k square footage. And so that's how we get to 8.1. The estimator took that out. Um, and then we looked at it with six HVAC options. So these are really the, the ones that receive more attention. And everything after that is a little bit of an extrapolation. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, this slide is to talk about how we go from construction costs to overall project costs. Um, construction costs includes what it takes to build the building, but it doesn't include what we call soft cost items. This is furniture and technology. This is um, fees for the design team, for other consultants, special testing. Um, there's a number of things that, that go here. Your owner's repre representative would be here at their fee. Um, and so we used a pretty conservative um, multiplier. We multiplied by 1.3, or 30% is what we increased to go from construction costs to project costs. 
that's something we could look at. We benchmarked another project in Massachusetts. We were a little less than that. So we might have been a little over conservative in that number. Um, if you want to come back to that, we can. Can I ask a question? Sure. Because if you compound the contingencies plus this, uh, it adds like 58% of the construction cost. Of the direct cost. Of the direct cost. It adds up to 58.6%. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, what, what I will say is I wouldn't conflate them, but they're, t they're two different groups of things. We can talk about both. Um, but this one is taken from the total cost that already has some contingency. Right. It is true. They, they, they do kind of do this sort of It's not 30% of the direct cost, but it's the 30% of, of the all that already right. has 25, 23, something percent of contingencies. Right. This is That's pretty typical perfect. across yeah. the across the industry. That that is typically the way you would do that. Okay, then that's why we, we can talk about the parts of it, and I think there are important parts to talk in there. But that is not unusual. Okay, just because it's I would have thought that the soft cost would go with the direct cost, not with the contingencies. Okay. No, we usually have that at the, at the end okay. when we look at the fortune factor. Just but I think we picked a pretty high factor. Is what could you I said. repeat what the multiplier was? What did you use? We used 1.3. Okay. And it was the same. I meant to say it's a, it was the same across all the options. Again, we did apples to apples. We didn't think about, you know, maybe if we do option E, there's a little less fee for something or other. We didn't get into that kind of granularity at this point. Um, so I don't know that that's necessary. Um, and so here are all the project costs now. So this is basically the same slide you saw in black, but everything's been multiplied by 1.3. And so that would be your total project budget. Um, we be able to pursue this project through these numbers. Um, I don't think I need to dwell on the, the numbers right now. We'll probably come back. Um, um, there was a question about um, PV panels how much they cost and how the different systems would affect the quantity of PV panels and, and how much is net zero because we know we have to be net zero for this project. What's the premium there? Think about that. Um, and so and before you get into the full answer to that, before you arrived there was a there was a question from the, the public comment period uh, asking about how the EUI of the building yeah. would affect the overall and I know this slide partly addresses that but I wanted to kind of slot that in if I could. Perfect. Yeah. So if you remember, EUI is the energy use intensity. Now, if you're net zero, the overall energy use intensity when you take into account the solar panels is zero. Um, but the question is, how many solar panels do you need to make up the EUI of the building? In other words, the building needs a certain amount of energy. You need to have solar panels to offset that. So there's, this slide shows two strategies. Um, if we were to set the building EUI at 50, the higher number of the two we're going to look at. Uh, we need more solar panels. We need more photovoltaics. Um, the pink area, if you look at all the pink area on the slide, is the amount of um, photovoltaics we need for an EUI of 50. And the cost is $442,000 project cost. So uh, you, you'll find a smaller number if you look in the estimate under direct costs because it doesn't have all those adders added into it that we talked about. So this is now the project cost. It's been increased to represent the overall project burden of the, of the photovoltaics. Um, so that that's the net zero premium in, in our minds because a building of an EUI of 50 is pretty conventional construction for us. We've done a number of schools um, at that level of performance, and we're not getting pushed into let's say, the more premium um, building technologies that are out there that start to have more cost associated, if you follow me. Um, so we looked at it and said, well, if we go to an EUI of 30, we could have fewer photovoltaics. Uh, if you look at the site plan, um, for the ground-mounted array, which is um, to the east of the building, or above the building and the site plan, the, there's a black line um, identifying an area of PV that would be required if we went to 30. The lighter colored PV wouldn't be needed. It's, um, it's about 60% of the area uh, that you would still need the over the parking, you'd still need on the building. Um, 
so the PV panel cost, if we, if we made the building performance better and brought it down to an EUI of 30, the PV panel cost is reduced to 265000 So you would save a little less than uh, $200,000 by reducing the building EUI. However, there's a cost um, increase um, beyond what we've estimated into the cost for the building to make the envelope better and to potentially use geothermal systems to get to that EUI of 30. Um, so that's what we also listed in that EUI of 30 analysis. We put the cost for the geothermal option, which is an, an additional 2.38 million project, as well as increase for envelope, 2.53 million project. And that's reflecting going to triple pane windows, that's going full insulation under the, uh, under the slab, um, and I can give you a better summary of all those things that we think would be involved to get to EUI of 30. Um, but but I, I'm hoping the overall concept is coming through. That our, our basis um, throughout the estimating was to use the EUI of 50 approach to take a more conventional building and have more <coughs> solar panels because the cost of the solar panels is, is relatively not that much compared to the cost to make a premium bill. Uh, you have the luxury of acreage that a lot of sites don't, a lot of projects don't, and that, that allows you to do, uh, as, as Jesse mentioned, a much more conventional building and still achieve your goal of net zero. Whereas if we didn't have that room, then we would really be forced into a building uh, with a much better UI. Go ahead. And the, the, the site element shown is consistent with, with what is existing right now? Like we've got two soccer fields and one ball field, and or is that because like right, we never really talked lines. about um, the site. programming of the site in this committee much? So I totally understand. Uh, well, in this option, because we're doing the new building with the smaller footprint, I think it's pretty equivalent in that you have two good soccer fields. Now they're now they're where the old building used to be, and you have the baseball field. We did have a baseball field overlaid with your soccer field, so we could probably show a, a baseball field here as well. But yeah, okay, just to follow up on that, that conversation, not that I want to open this can of worms, but the school really, you know, those fields are used by the community more so than the school. Sure. So just wanted the community to understand that what we're showing here is well beyond what a typical elementary school building would ha would have, or e even with the solar panels there. No. We certainly use it as a community <coughs> resource, but sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, I guess we're saying we could do less solar panel area, um, but there would be a premium for that. And that's not been rolled into these numbers. Typically these numbers are are the top case where we went to an EUI of fifty and we didn't we didn't put a lot of pressure on the building design trying to get to a better energy performance. So all the designs are even 50? Yes, yes. Um, so the other thing we noted is that PV panel, so I guess that's your net zero premium in our estimate is that 442,000 for option A, it would be basically half of that for option B, and then a third of that for option C and keep going down. But PV panels could be procured via um, a lease agreement, a power purchase agreement, which I think would then remove any cost of the project. So suddenly this, yeah, I guess that's up to the town as to whether they would consider doing that. But uh, a lease agreement would not have a uh, project cost. So net zero could be zero from that point of view, zero cost. Mr. Realize, that's a question. May I? I'm not a member of it. It, it, I, I'm willing to break a little protocol. <laughs> I think you're going to read us from the net zero bylaw yes. here in a second, which yeah. I think would be helpful. Well, yes. I, I was instrumental in creating the net zero bylaw. Great. There's wording in there that that doesn't set an EUI, uh, hard EUI standard, but the intent, uh, certainly the intent of the bylaw is to build a, a very energy efficient envelope, very energy efficient HVAC system, um, and to minimize the, the need for PV. Um, uh, so, and, and that's, that's item, my first re reaction. <clears throat> my second is we have three two-story buildings in this town that are net zero that do not have collectors on the, floor, on the ground or on the, uh, over the parking. So I find it surprising that we can't 
that, that we can't make it work with a two-story building. And then presumably, um, you know, a school has higher ventilation requirements and might need more than a two than two of the three buildings that I'm thinking of. That would be South Congregational Church and and uh, um, oh dear, the new the building next to Gordon Hall. What's it called? <laughs> a new Cry, building uh, on in, on campus. So I'm surprised that we have that that there's as much PV on the on the site as you have there. I I'm quite surprised. And what is the efficiency of the? That's the third question. Is what is the efficiency of the collectors you're proposing there? I'll have to check. And and, um, and 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 then I would just sort of strongly advocate for an EUI of 30 or something around there. That's but not having a slab, or not having an insulated slab, not having triple glazing, all that sort of stuff doesn't sound like a net zero building to me. And, and that's kind of why we raised this, is right. what is a net zero building to you? Is it just balancing as the as we read the code strictly? I think that's all you'd have to do to meet the code. But if, if uh, our moral goal is to do uh, something better, you could. And you know, we could do it. We've done EUI of 30 buildings before for schools. Yeah, I still had the, the bylaw out. If yes, <laughs> what, was there a specific language? Like, what is the language that is trying to <coughs> give me a second? At the, the driving, you know, first do energy efficiency, second do panels. And when you find it, you can just throw your hand on Why don't you just, uh, <laughs> it's been a while since I've done this. Um, can you, can you give me a little time? Yep. Yeah, Do something better. else for a while? <laughs> sure. So this, is, this is a, uh, I, we have a lot more to cover, yep. so I will ask this question quickly. This is a great example where I'm curious what kind of feedback you're looking for, because um, before, I think maybe before you came in, we might have been talking about this, that in my mind, regardless of what we run through as a scenario for option A, um, I actually like having a report that lays out the alternatives and the costs and benefits associated with the different alternatives so that somebody can understand what a building with an EUI of 50 and solar looks like. I might even like to know what it looks like I don't know. There's a way of estimating what the cost of a power purchase would be, in terms of the operating cost of the of the, of the building. Would be interesting to know that, and then also similarly doing an EUI of 30 with a reduced number of solar, but a, a tighter building envelope. So yeah, I actually like having that information. But what are you looking for from us? I'm I'm happy to provide that. I think we've provided that information, yeah. and yeah. I think we would wrap this into the report. If you'd like us to go further, yes. Chris. In terms of operating costs, if we have some information we can share today, we could perhaps go a little further. Thank you very much. I just want to propose that we let them. <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, which is a good segue to see the requirement. I was going to say just one. I mean, I guess the one question is like, it seems like which one of these would we want to include as the baseline? Right now, we're including the uh, the thirty. Excuse me, the, the 50 is the baseline. I right. think this committee might be more interested in including the 30 as the baseline for our estimate numbers. Uh, because that's, I mean, the one liner coming out of this committee is the cost. Right. And, and the one liner, I think, really needs to reflect the values of the community as much as it can. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So let's move on and come back to it. Sure. Because I think there's a follow up question that has to do with how do we make sure that the other ones are comparable? Yeah. And I'd like to hear that comment, but let's get through the rest of the, Chris, the yeah. general <laughs> presentation. Um, uh, but it, uh, so it's in the definition of zero energy capable. Uh, the definite uh, the building has to be zero energy capable. Uh, the envelope does designed based on the energy budget in a compliance with the zero energy requirements, incorporating highly efficient standards to minimize the project need for energy, <coughs> and incorporating renewable energy systems with enough capacity supply the energy needed and so incorporating highly efficient standards that's that's our which we ended up deciding to try not to tag that to an EUI but certainly the spirit of the bylaw is to build a really terrific envelope and a really terrific HVAC system okay 
I understand that. Yep. Um, to get to your operating cost question, we haven't done a full analysis, but we have um, a slide which I think we showed to you previously, which uh, maybe you can spend a little more time with tonight. Um, your current energy cost per year at Fort River School is is very close to that average current that EUI of 110, and it's $116,000, $117,000 per year. Of course, it fluctuates year to year. That number is so precise, it's, all these numbers are unnecessarily precise. They're the result <laughs> of calculations. So there's going to be a range. Um, just bear that in mind. Um, you know, green building, or high performance at 65 EUI, or green building at 55, 50 we're doing better than both of those categories as, as given to us from our lead consultant. Um, but you can see the cost of the, the green building um, it is a good amount less, 57,821. Uh, now, of course, you'd be net zero in option A, so your, your utility cost would be zero. So you could think about that. The 10 years of not doing a project and going on with the Fort River School would be 10 times 116,000. Uh, so over a million versus a net zero building would be zero. Uh, or you could also think about the renovation, which I think probably the renovation is going to be more like a 65. It's going to be harder to push that up to the 50. Um, the previous slide, as you remember, dealt with new construction, but some of these options have renovation. So you could start to think about um, those renovation areas over 10 years would be under a million dollars, but still a significant number. Um, so that may help you think about um, operational costs. And we could, we could write that up a little bit more. Um, so the next part of the presentation is about phasing. Just keep moving through it. We, we thought about how much time and, and what the process would be to construct each of these options um, in a little more detail. Um, there's a, a gradient, again, to a certain extent, that option A, which is a new building, is very simple because you just build the building next to the existing footprint. Uh, and we think that could happen in 24 months. Sometimes it even goes down to 22 months, but we work with 24 would be conservative a little bit. Um, and then as we're doing more um, smaller additions, we have less swing space. And so the, um, the phasing is getting more complicated, as you'll see, and the duration goes up. So let's dive into it. Um, so option A, we don't have diagrams for because it's so straightforward. Option B, um, the blue shows what, what's being built at this time, and the gray shows the existing. Um, so we're building the new two-story addition in option B on the right side, and we're renovating the corridors to create a connection. Uh, we have a uh, duration of about a year for that. It took a little more or less. Um, and then now that that blue area is done, um, we're now renovating um, sort of the center of the building, but we have these corridors connecting between um, the existing areas on the left side and the new areas on the right side. Uh, we have classrooms on the first floor on the left side and then also on the second floor, which you don't see, which are on the right side. So it, it's, it achieves the number of classrooms you have now. It exceeds it. And then finally, um, we finish <coughs> renovating that interior space, uh, and, and we can demolish the part we were intending to demolish to get to our final option B plan. Uh, option C is going to be the same concept again. Um, in this case, the new addition is smaller. Um, so we're building the, the addition, and we're renovating the gym uh, in the summer. We're going to be renovating the, the classrooms um, to get a corridor connection through. Um, we'd be building mechanical space over here, a new mechanical space, and then back to you. Um, and then in the second phase, we're now renovating the interior of the building. Because we've already renovated the classrooms, we have connections through. So the building is larger <coughs> than it needs to be at the end. Um, so we're able to renovate the center. And finally, when that renovation is complete, we're getting close. Um, we thought about one more phase to, to complete this um, renovation, which is mostly demolition and some renovation space, which could be done over the summer. Oh, sorry. Mike. 
So first, I just want to say, I don't know if the point of it, but I really appreciate the mm -hmm. color coding and how you showed the renovation, because conceptually, it, it can make sense to someone like me who's not in the field, so I really appreciate that. So my question is, how much, because you referenced this in, in some of these, how much of the construction would it be environmentally possible to do while students are in the building, and how much of this is happening over the summer? Now, I don't need, like, I'm not looking you to go option by option and phase by phase, but just in general, what's the kind of guiding principle of, of how you would do this work, you know, would it be happening off hours, would it be happening? What work is, is permissible, really? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Students while students are staff. live in there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose every community has a different tolerance for that. Uh, we have done construction projects where um, construction is happening, um, for example, in this blue area, while students are in session uh, in the classrooms. So, and that, that is what we're thinking about here. Okay. Um, so now, what construction activities are happening in there? there um, it's mostly interior renovation and systems. There is some exterior wall work required around the um, around the courtyard, um, there would be plumbing. It, so I don't know. I guess I'm getting into the weeds a little bit. But, but that is what we're thinking say about. That it, it, is, it is complex. And, and it is complex. And, and these there are has just to be some trade-offs between what activities can go on at certain times. And that affects the length of time. Yeah. You know? and, I, go ahead. And for example, there's some activities that you, you really want to arrange your schedule around the summers. Uh, hazardous materials abatement. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's possible to be done while school's in session over weekends, but it's an enormous hassle. Uh, and, and generally communities frown on it even if it's possible. So, so you have to kind of sometimes go into areas where you may not be working until after Christmas break. You might have to go into the summer, take down ceilings to do some abatement. And then the question is, do we put temporary ceilings back in or do we leave it open so it kind of looks a little shabby? So, so those are, that's the kind of fine-grained stuff Early on, Jesse said we used a CM as sort of the baseline. It, it's kind of looking at those sort of options because that's the kind of thing that a construction manager can really drill down in working with the administration on, on what's our tolerance. And then even once you have a plan, you're going to get into there, and there's going to be a guy shooting studs into the slab, and it's going bang, bang, and meanwhile, a teacher's got testing. testing going on. And she comes in, you got to stop. So everything stops, and we got to rework our plan and come back tonight after school's out and catch up. So that's where, again, a construction manager is very helpful uh, because they can work with you to, to deal with that, whereas a, a general contractor will be less cooperative in that scenario. That's really helpful. That answers, I mean, that's the level of detail I'm looking for, so thank Good you. Good enough for now. Yeah. And I'm assuming all these plans are looking at the 420 school uh, yes. because it, the reason we can shift people around is because we're not at full capacity. Like We do have extra swing space, so this these phasings really wouldn't apply to the three, our lower school population. Um, These are planning for a 465 school at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, the pre-K program hasn't begun yet. So that space is already right. some space. Um, right. Does that, yeah. if, if you're talking about to get to a 315, um, we have to think about that a little more. It seems like in general you have space um, in that case because you have your students, um, but no, I guess. But then in the end, you don't have as much square footage because sure. right now you're taking the existing population, growing it to four whatever. But if you're at the existing and, and targeting existing, you don't really have swing space. So then you get point. into the okay. additions so become smaller, and yeah. so you don't get as much swing space. And that's right. Area. So these it's apply true. to the large school these population. Are the one. Yeah, yeah. Good point. There would be ways to phase it, but it it, it, yeah. it would be different than this. Yeah, and they may involve temporary classrooms, as we yeah. start to see as we go further. Um, but B and C, because we have pretty good size additions, um, it expands the overall square footage right from the outset and allows us to avoid temporary classrooms. Um, D does as well. Um, we're building the pre-K and the gym addition um, in the first 12 months. And then in that summer, um, the first or second summer, probably, we're renovating the classrooms uh, in that quarter. Um, okay, and then for the next uh, school year, we're, we're needing to renovate the interior uh, and build that courtyard and bring in daylight. Um, and that involves a bunch of rooms. We listed the rooms that are taken there, which are under construction. 
and then we proposed where they might go. Um, and these are the so I, don't, I won't go through every room, but I'll just say we were temp we were thinking of temporarily using the the gym uh, for a media center and book storage, uh, probably the math rooms and a small conference room, which were taken by construction, and then using the the new pre-K wing, which doesn't have pre-K students yet, uh, for two general classrooms, which are missing, um, three <coughs> special education rooms, one ELL room, one OT room, and one speech room. Um, and so that's how we thought we could fit it all within the existing footprint uh, for that year while the interior is being renovated. Um, and then that interior would come online. Um, and we would need to renovate in the summer the cafeteria and kitchen, the areas in blue, the main central spaces in the building, uh, and, and also complete the gym. Uh, and then we have another five month period where we're renovating what used to be the administration. Now the administration is able to move to their new space right in the front door. And so we have to find a space for the rooms that are currently in that blue area where we're still renovating. Um, so we have the pre-K wing being used for kindergarten space. We have a temporary computer lab, because that space is being built. And then we have um, a temporary music room. And that's not too long, that's about five months. And then finally, about 36 months in, we're, we're done. And that's gonna feel very much the same as option E. The difference in option E is we don't have the gym addition. Um, so there's less swing space to begin with. So, we build the pre-K wing, um, it takes about 12 months. We renovate in the summer as much as we can in that U shape. Um, but then when we go to renovate that interior area, we just don't have enough swing space. Um, so we, we need to bring in some temporary classrooms. And so we have them for the media center, the book storage, the math, and the small conference room. We didn't actually have to put general classrooms into the temporary classrooms in this case. And similar to option D, then we're, we're finishing up the central spaces, um, the cafeteria, kitchen, music <coughs> over the summer, and then we're um, renovating the administration um, and the kindergarten area. So we need a temporary band and orchestra and a temporary music room, and we have temporary kindergarten back in the pre-K wing, which is similar to option D. Finally, the administration suite is done, and we can wrap up the uh, renovation. Uh, and then when that last blue area is renovated, we can move music and band into that space um, and art. Uh, and we are complete. So we had about 36 months for that one as well. Um, so I made it through. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, it might make sense to start with with questions on the last piece first. Right. Just be, well, well, they were there. <laughs> now that you're off the way back, I don't know. Do folks have the, the phase that you met generally makes sense? Um, do you have questions about that? Um, I have lots of questions, but I'd like to start sure. with um, something that I have been trying to explain to people. And I have, I don't. I feel like I don't have a handle on it, and that is, we have options A through F. For the reno options, there's part that's new and part that's reno. We know that the new construction um, being compliant with the net zero bylaw has to be net zero, has no fossil fuels. The reno portion of that could continue to use the gas boiler. Um, and my question is, with all of these options, I, I heard an answer. I, I think I know the answer to this question is it isn't using the gas boiler. But I'd just like to understand what of existing systems would continue to be used. What is the energy source for heating, cooling, and electricity in the renovation portions of options B through E? Yeah. Um, so, let's see, which one do we start? With option B, we're not saving the boiler room due to the way that the layout works. Um, as for what can be reused in the um, 
rest of the mechanical and plumbing distribution system to reach the classroom. If you remember, we talked about the classrooms having unit ventilators, which are providing heating and cooling. Those, we said, have to go. Those are just not meeting acoustic standards. They're breaking down as it is, and um, they're just bad. Um, so that means we're going to need to provide heat and cool to, to the classrooms. Our, our base schemes are on the um, VAV system. Um, so um, that's, um, let's see, that would be a, a electric, well, I'm not actually sure. Um, hmm. I may have to get this together a bit more to be able to answer that. When we're using the boiler, we are, we are um, in option E and D, where feeding our systems from hot water provided by the boiler for perimeter heat. Um, so I suppose it would be the same in option B for a renovation area. Uh, we would have the same gas-fired boiler. Uh, when I was reading the, and I guess I got kind of no. varying Maria's, can, well, I'm not sure that I can. Um, <laughs> my, my reading of the, of the, um, the narrative suggested that because there was basically little value except for the, the reasonably new boilers to all the rest of the distribution systems, that it was all effectively new. And so my interpretation of that was that really we're probably giving up the I, my assumption was after reading that was we're giving up the boilers for really all the schemes and we we're providing some new input um, and I guess I had maybe wrongly intuited that that it was basically you know, like that we were using the same systems everywhere and we were only offsetting um, with the PV the, the new areas um, yeah. and so therefore it would be electrical the electricity would be our heating and cooling and maybe well, that was uh, the new areas would need to be electrical yeah. I guess you'd have an option in the renovation areas whether we go for an electric boiler or a gas boiler. But, um, so there, in some of the options, we are assuming the boiler room stays, and we're able to reuse those gas boilers as they are. Um, but for the rest, when we're doing a new mechanical yeah. room, we could go either way, I guess. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, What's I mean, the point? Where are we going? I think we just want to know what I forgot. we're using. So yeah, if I, asked, I want we can to be able it. to say, like, okay, so in in option C, where you know it's what seventy one percent renovation. Are are we? I mean, the, the gas boilers are not that old. I'm not advocating for fossil fuel use. I would love to see it go away. But sure. I, I just need to explain to people like yeah. we are or are not using the gas boilers. We are using. We are basically you know. And if we're not, why are we not? And you know, it, what's the cost? What's the cost benefit in other ways? Um, and then to say, I, I understand based on the PV that we're not that the renovation portions are not net zero because we we'd be using the grid to get electricity. Right. But by not using the gas, if we're not using the gas boilers, then we're actually exceeding the net zero bylaws requirements to. Because it doesn't say you have to get rid of your fossil fuel for renovation, but if we are doing that, I think we need to explain that and say okay. we're doing this, and this is why we're doing it, and this is why we think it's a good idea. Uh, it it right. just has to be made clear because I can't answer the question about the boilers. Okay, <laughs> I understand. I love you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it's kind of in the same vein as far as less to do with like the heating system, but the general. Um, there's no arc there. I didn't see any architectural narrative that went along with the cost. So it's like what there, there was one. There, like, do we ever talk about like what we're targeting for insulation, for insulation values of water? Right. I just but missed it. Yeah, no, <laughs> so we don't get into insulation values. We um, communicated with our mechanical. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah, just like in general, like how are we how are we treating the the renovation portion as far as like we have this, this slab that's there, and I'm assuming it's. Like, that we aren't jackhammering the whole thing up, um, you know. No, we yeah. Uh, um, and and I guess I it kind of gets into like the the narrative for the um, the lean scorecard, sure. and um, in general, like it's it would be helpful if the lean scorecard also followed the same um, options that that we have laid out. Um, because it's confusing to me how like we're targeting the same um, like in the energy and atmosphere credits that optimize energy performance we're <coughs> saying that we can target the same number 
of, of energy performance in an almost entirely renovation project that we can in a new construction project, and I'm skeptical that we can actually achieve that. And I guess that's where, if, if I had read the architectural narrative, I might have got a better understanding of, of how on the LEED scorecard we, we feel like we can get to the same energy performance out of a renovation project that we can in a totally new construction. Did the question ever land there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, yeah, I think the um, LEED point system uh, gives us some benefit from using uh, the existing building when it comes to energy performance. So you're comparing against the baseline, which is um, less high performing. So I think that's, oh, that's, built into that's the part of why that's happening there. So we don't mean to say in those scorecards that a, a renovation project is going to be as energy efficient as a new building. Uh, that's first. I think you alluded to that earlier. So when you, I think you had said something about it. You know, the best EUI might be 65, 65 for the for renovation, 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 which kind of intuitively makes sense because you're not replacing all those systems. Right. And I'll something. check to your question, but I think we're using gas boilers in the renovation areas right now. And, and if you tell us we needed to go non-fossil fuel, we could look at it that way, I suppose. Um, but I, I think the reason to use gas is it's, it's very efficient okay. and cost-effective. Like, sorry. Yeah, so it, it's sort of related. So this the slide we spent quite a bit of time on in the net zero. Which is, I had two thoughts that I wanted to share, and I have to leave in about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, I apologize. So one is that I just think a similar model could be developed for B through E, because I don't want anyone walking away feeling like the net zero bylaw is not being followed. Granted, at an, albeit at a smaller scale, because of the different percent of new, um, and, and with the same cost pieces, because you know I, I don't want. One thing that I think would be helpful for the community to see is that the same commitment towards anything new being net zero is present and that there's a range of net zero possibilities. Um, I think the second thing I wanted to say is I imagine, and I'm not trying to suggest that you should do this, but I imagine there's some place between 50 and 30, right? Like if you did the envelope work but not the change the HVAC system. So um, I just think it'd be important for people to realize that it's not like there's two slots, 50 and 30, that you can lock into. Right, they're, they're fairly and I think yeah, and I think the last thing is, you know, the challenge, and perhaps this is something, I don't have a strong opinion, but the way I conceptualized the conversation or reflect on the conversation earlier is what do we want to make the base, right? So right now the base cost has an EUI, sorry, this is my language, of 50, and then we look at it as an add-on, and is there a way to present a range of options so that we can get feedback? Because it, 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 appear, it may appear to someone that the committee is favoring an EUI of 50. Right, we're not trying very hard. And, right, and, and, or we're being, like, people could come to other conclusions, right, about that, that it's cost is more important, right, and, and maybe those are true, but they're not, I don't feel like there's a consensus in the committee on those topics, so. Maria? I think, you know, uh, what might help clarify all these kind of nitty gritty and comparison things, you know, we came up with the list of non negotiable items for the design, right? Sure. Everything's going to have daylight, everything, it's going to be acoustic, all that. Could we maybe come up with the list so people understood like all of the options? These are the non-negotiable energy, uh, you know, and and um, what what is our baseline? If you um, have non-negotiables that we need to roll into this that haven't been previously identified, I think we haven't talked about I think we it in this fully level articulated of detail. Them, yeah. but I think we have some. <laughs> yeah, and I think that um, it, it would be helpful. You, you talked about comparing what the different options would look like on that slide they had. You know, this is the green entry, this is the, with, with the different UIs sure. to, to plug in our, our letter options so we can correlate that and to talk about what, what are the R value. You know, what are we talking about, for instance? I, this is a kind of a geeky community, right? We, <laughs> um, so uh, I think that and it'll, it'll help us to to compare and to put what you're proposing into perspective. Eric? Yeah, so uh, a, a couple of things. Um, one, I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, there may, we may be able to come up with things that are non-negotiable <laughs> around energy, but other than compliance with the bylaw, but I'm not sure that's really what I'm looking for in terms of a report, so much as really good clarity about the information and sort of the menu and implications of different options and choices that the community is being presented with, and real clarity about that. 
I do think that we should have, we should choose our base case wisely. Um, in, in my view, the base case should be probably a more aggressive um, energy efficiency around the building envelope because I think that at least the sort of the gestalt of the effort of the town in promoting a, a zero energy building was to, you know, try to push the push our practice in our town, our lived practice, around um, around building efficiency and sustainability, um, not just purely netting out uh, uh, the energy. And uh, so that so I, I think, and I also I think it's better to argue from that point, well, even if the number looks a little larger. I'd rather argue from that point than, than act like we're treating. I think Mike said it right. Acting like we're treating the effort to increase the efficiency of the building systems or envelope like it's uh, an extra add-on. You know, if you want this, you have to pay more for it. I don't think that really matches the spirit of the enterprise of the work that we're trying to do, regardless of what the town ends up arguing. You know, when people get the report, they argue over the expense and whether they want to do it. What goes with that, though, to me, is that, it, and forgive me if it's, in, again, you said earlier, if it's in the narrative, I apologize. but. I think we need to be up. We need to be really upfront and transparent in reporting what the different options look like from an energy use and an energy efficiency standpoint, as well as anything else you're assuming around like rainwater or something like that. Um, why? Because I just if you're building in a set of assumptions that the um, R factor of the rehab portions of the building are somehow substantially different than what they are in the new portions of the building. Uh, I just want to know it. And I want and, and I want people, when they're looking at the different options, to just know what that is. Um, same thing around the, the, the whatever's powering the, the systems. And then if there are any, and then I guess the other point I'd make is, is if, is if similar to this business of getting to a, a higher energy efficiency for the uh, new construction, if there's a similar story you would tell around the rehab, uh, we were making this assumption around how much we are pushing the efficiency of the existing uh, building. Um, but you know, actually, we could have done more, but we didn't build that in. But here's what it would cost to do X and Y. Um, you'd be interested in none of that. Does it make sense, or is that asking you to do a whole other report, and that's too much work? Uh, well, there, um, not necessarily, um, but. That was the goal of the slide that shows the two EUIs, right? That this is where we are, and we could do more, and we're trying to get feedback as to what you want the report to say. And, and we could switch the baseline, and then we could look back and say, well, we could do less, and that's, that's already done, and we could look at potentially doing more. The only, reason, the only reason I'm looking for a little more information on that, I guess, I guess the unstated thought I had was from, from pro probably <laughs> Probably helps having members of the audience here who are very passionate about this to put it top of mind, which is a good thing. Um, is, is sort of a running assumption has been if the portion of the building isn't required to be zero energy, then it won't be zero energy. <coughs> and so I could easily see somebody in town saying, well, this is a feasibility study. I want to know what the feasibility of different options are. Why didn't you look into, or could you look into, whether some of the options where there's rehab uh, could be zero energy? Right. And what it would cost to do that? Um, now that may be uh, that may be a, you might tell me no no you don't understand for ten good, really good reasons that's an absolutely crazy thing to say, no, um, and that doesn't bother. Those ten reasons. Well no no but I'm yeah. saying but then list the ten reasons so that we can share them with the public because I'm I'm saying I'm just saying that I think that for some people coming walking in the door and seeing a range of options and saying I get they're all compliant with the bylaw, but I'm also seeing. That the adherence to the bylaw is is like really rote and explicit, meaning if I don't have to reach zero energy, I'm not trying to. Mm -hmm. um, that 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 the response back is going to be, well, did you look into what it would cost to either a make it zero energy for the entire building, or b if not push the level of efficiency up to a reasonably high, a reasonably highest level you could in the areas that are being rehabbed. And, and I'd want to know what the answer to that is. Well, I think we could address rehab similarly as we did new construction. I think that's what you're saying, in that we looked at, you know, um, rehab would conventionally have a EUI, which is this, and we need to be offset by all these solar panels. It's going to be quite a lot. And it might not fit on the site anymore or whatever. And then we could look at, well, there are things we could do in a renovation that would really drop the EUI 
may not be as much as new construction. We could drop it probably more there still, but that would have fewer solar panels. Might be feasible. Um, and then you'd have the cost for those additional solar panels and that additional work to the rehab, which would be more than we've estimated here. I guess we can we could do something like that. Um, so I sense a couple uh, a couple hands. I know Mike, you have to leave. Rene, is it okay if you guys? Okay. It'll be brief, but I yeah. thank you. Um, so I just I'm going to put it just a finer point. In. So whatever this page ends up looking like based on the feedback, uh, I think it'd be good to have this page for all the options, right? Because some of it's about energy, like the conversation we're having. I'm going back to Heather's comment earlier about the site and how many PVs are on the site, ball fields, and that's going to look presumably different than the renovation options. Because in any of these schemes, you're going to need fewer PVs if you're, I'm guessing, right? just as a percentage. So. I think just that way it shows that there's no favoring one option versus another and that people get a better sense of what it would actually look like on the site given you know the different levels of newness and, and renovation. So I think even if it's some of them are so close, like you know, D and E may not look much different, but I think it then gives we're we're giving equal attention to all the different options that are being developed. But you could actually factor in the answer you're giving to my question and to his request because the lower right hand side boxes could then have information on if there was some sort of additional level of investment that he had put in, you could write it in, right? I think so. Exactly. It's possible. So we're going to go to Arena, and then I'm going to kind of wonder if we want to move on to other areas of question, because I'm sure there are. So, so I have a quick question for my Who owns the fields? Is it school property or is it town property? There, um, there's, it's not like the region. There's, there's not a particular distinction between okay. town and yeah, and the town owns all the property. Okay, that's yeah. probably the best. Um, so, one comment Sorry. I wanted to make is I look at the narrative, and I don't remember seeing about the boilers. Maybe because I had a page, so maybe I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find it, but I, I looked and I couldn't find anything regarding boilers. So, okay. so, so, so I, think, I think my assumption seems to be that there was. Not mentioning inside, maybe I skip it. Well, the floor plans keep the boiler room where it is in two options. Yeah, but there's no, in the narrative, there was no anywhere mentioned about. So you're concerned that the estimator may have considered additional boilers, new boilers? Either new boilers, either new boilers or what type of boilers or. Okay. What's the difference between all of them, what they consider? Um, and then the other suggestion was. I think, I think the committee should decide is we have too many things. If we start adding diff another layer with your eyes, uh, I'm wondering whether everybody would be agreed to do it only for the 465. So we have one benchmark where we have the depth of the different UIs only for the 465. And then we can. I think that makes sense is yeah. because we also do the phasing only for that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, just. So this is good information yeah. to have, but I think if you're going to increase the UI, I think that just to be nice yeah. and not have 300 options. Yeah. Not only um, is it a lot of work for you, but it's a little much for the community to process and for us to process. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. it's hard for us to process this, this yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on that you note. have a separate chart to do the, to and, the UIs. And it might be one of those things where. There's going to be a certain level of information in the body of the final report, and then there's going to be other information that that you want to dig deeper. Maybe is is as kind of an addendum, not the right word, appendix. Right, right, appendix. Um, but uh, I apologize. So are we? We're we would still have information on this analysis for multiple options, multiple sizes. You're saying for illustrative purposes, the illustration would be the course of the I think uh, so, And yes. the different calculation of cost of the UI, different UIs only for the 465. So we wouldn't do that for the, I feel that's what the superintendent was asking for. That, that yeah. diagram, which I'm gonna do overall, the letters, is related to the 465 option. And, and the site plan would also then just be for the, you know, do a site plan for every one of those options. And then, yeah. and then an explanatory text, which you talked about, we could talk about <coughs> the, the costs of going above and beyond 
with the existing building if you want to drive that. As long as we, we have the numbers, as long as we have the numbers for the others, I'm just trying to make sure I know what decision we're just making. <laughs> <laughs> because because I, what I don't want to do is accidentally get in a situation where we decided not to have numbers and analysis for a non pre cut option. So I think that's a mistake. Um, if as long as it's in there somewhere. Uh, that people can get it and they can find it, then illustrating one straight through is fine with me. I think if we don't have the, the non pre K option, then it has the facing becomes completely different because they are using the swing space of the pre, the pre K as swing space. So then you have to start doing a whole new analysis about facing and cost because the pre K is being used in most options except A and B. The pre K is being used for swing space. So then um, you need to repeat everything, the whole analysis with no pre -K. Well, I think that gets back to Jesse's comment earlier where, you know, the, the 465 is, is the one that's the most detailed and a lot of the other cost information is, is extrapolated up and down from there. And what we're talking about when it comes to varying the, the envelope, again, would probably be some level of extrapolation um, but the but there's a somewhat parallel but somewhat separate discussion about the, the the slide that kind of talks about the primary you know the a b c d e and a lot of that is most so far as mostly focused on the on again that that 465 model and that um, when we start shrinking the building there, there would be other impacts um, and I guess I'm looking at Eric, wondering, have we, are we, what level of granularity do we need in the in, in the graphics to talk about that past where we are? Do you feel like if you're, are we losing something that you feel we, we want to make sure we hit? I just want I just want to make sure in the end when people look at this that it doesn't look like we did a real analysis of option, the 465 option, and then we did some sketches of the others. And so that when someone looks at it, they say, the 465 analysis seems real and thorough to me, but for the other ones, they're really uh, indicative as opposed to really analytically strong. And so if you're telling me that's not true, uh, and that they are analytically strong, and you could rely upon them. And presumably you'd have some illustrations of what they look like, because you've been showing them already, about some basic senses of what they what they look like. Um, I think that would be helpful. There's 147 options on that matrix. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, so I don't. And we're not planning to document those um, all at the same level, as you know. Right. And I don't think that's what you're suggesting, but I do need to be careful about what I'm agreeing to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, honestly, I just honestly, uh, it, I guess, I guess. Otherwise, what would be useful to me would be to indicate what the difference between a 465 and what is it, 420? Or are those numbers 450? I threw those 350. I know. But that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so I'm saying if you take pre-K out. Oh, right. This is this has like been a source of argument all fall. Have yeah. you like forgotten already? I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm carrying water for the school committee. Yeah. That I want to make sure that the end report fairly shows what a with pre-K and a non-pre-K option look like. And if it seems like it's biased against having <coughs> analytical good and robust information for the non-pre-K option, I'm here arguing against doing that. On the other hand, I don't care if it's only focused on the 420 and 465 options, and the rest of them are, are weaker. I don't care about that. So I think what I'm hearing is that if um, the 420 has an impact phasing-wise, it should get modeled. And so it may not, but I think what I'm hearing is a request for you to go away and think about that. Okay. And report back in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we had we had this discussion about pre-K and non-pre-K, and I think we had agreed that the task that we were looking was with pre-K. Uh, so I don't mind having more emphasis having the pre-K, 
don't have any pre-dating in secondary because that was what we discussed and we had agreed upon. So if it's going to be another layer of complications, I don't mind you know, having a student without pre because I think that's what the task that we were for this committee was a school pre k through six. And, and the architects were nice enough that they're including the option without pre k but we originally started with pre k So if that is going to take time of doing a, some other analysis, I would prefer to go within the with pre k because that was what we decided. I think it's a it's a question of uh, how far you have to go to be credible. Um, so we've we've done an analysis of with and without pre-K um, for each of the six options. Um, you make a good point that the phasing, the construction duration, may need to be adjusted as pre-K falls out because we lose some swing space. Um, but I think the the amount that that's going to change the overall project budget is probably not that big. And so if your goal is order of magnitude numbers, um, I think you have useful information. Uh, but there's always going to be a point, because we're not going to delve into all of the details that are being thrown at us tonight, um, where we're not going to have the answer to those details without designing further into a building. And I think that's. That's some, you, you're going to have to, at the end of this, look at these numbers with a sense of um, tolerance that there's going to be a range that these numbers can't get into. I mean, under a million dollars right now, we're talking years away from the project. It's feeling like a fine grain, I'll be honest. Um, so I think we should try to focus on the big stuff. Um, right. Along those lines, <laughs> I think we need to. I think we need to get to. To some of the other numbers here, if, if, if we're good to move I, I on think from so. here. All right. So, could we look at this one? Yeah. Yeah. That, it's, it's basically the summary where we can talk about a lot of things. Um, so, the design contingency here is given as 12%. The escalation is 8%. Um, general requirements and uh, the general conditions is 137,500. So looking at recent MSBA projects, those percentages are higher. Um, the design contingency was, has been listed at, at 10%, for example, construction con contingency at, at two and a half. Um, but the escalation of 8% seems very generous. Um, I, I mean, I, I would just like to have some explanation there because what it what happens is that when you come down to these numbers, when you get to construction cost per square foot, um, option, just for simplicity, just looking at A, um, coming in at 552 seems high. And I would, I would like you to get a little bit more into that and get an explanation there because if you look at 2019 MSBA <coughs> projects, I mean, the average um, construction cost per square foot is in the more in the order of 470. So it seems it seems generous. So I'd like us to talk about that. I'd also like to talk about the other the soft cost of 30 percent because again that seems generous. And if this is I mean if the idea here is like this is these are extremely conservative numbers and you know and we're we're going big because we don't want to come in with something lower and then go up later. Right. I think we need to say that. But otherwise, all of those percentages <coughs> make a difference. And for example, the soft cost <coughs> in the past, in, in the last year at MSBA, was 25%, so the right. average. So, so that one, I think we went big, soft cost. So we can look at that, and, and I think we would tailor it down to 25, or even it could be 20, as low as 20. And we could think about that a little bit more relative to the general understanding of the needs this project. Um, and that will make a big impact, as you know. This, this is a, a big number changer. So that's a good point. I don't think these are conservative in that way. I think that one was, um, that was ours as opposed to our independent estimators for one. And I think I think I can explain these um, if, if that would help. Yes. Um, so let's start with um, design contingency, the first one you mentioned, 12%. Um, 
the way design contingency works is as you approach bid, as your documents continue to develop and you know more and more about the project and it's better defined, you ratchet down the design contingency. And what it's reflecting is the fact that we don't really know where this project is going 100% at this point, and there's scope mm -hmm. out there that hasn't been defined yet, and can't be estimated properly. And so that's sort of an industry standard way things are done. So depending on what phase estimate you look at, you can see less and less design contingency. So that may be why you see a difference. A 2% difference um, is also where we've got 147 options. You know, so how far could we go in terms of documenting them out, in terms of all of those pertinent details. Um, so it may be a little bit higher, partly because we're in feasibility, as opposed to uh, uh, schematic, schematic design, design or even even the PSR in the MSBA process, it could be a little lower. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, schematic design, all the exterior elevations would be documented so the windows would be accurately taken off. I mean, there'd be real quantities associated with everything in the estimate. Now there's a lot of assumptions based on standards and, and I mean, obviously we have floor plans and that helps, but so yeah, because we're not at a SD level, there's more unknown, so we have a bigger factor of safety in, in the. Yeah, I think that I think the, the point is we need to say that sure. now and not just say like it. This is to, this is a locked in number. It's to, it's to right. say because we're early and these other reasons, and it's likely to do something different in the future. I mean, those are the kind of things, because people see numbers on a page and then it's God's honest truth, mm -hmm. right? So I, we, I think we need to be cognizant of that. Okay, um, construction contingency, whether it's two and a half or three percent, those are pretty industry standard numbers. Um, we went with three percent in this case. And I guess I don't have a great rationale as to why one versus yeah. the other. I could check with the estimator. But escalation, um, what we've represented there is 4% per year, um, since we're looking two years in advance. So that's why it's 8% total. Um, and 4% is, is what we've seen in recent estimates. Actually, we were talking about our most recent estimates are actually trending up right now beyond that um, because there's concerns about tariffs and, and uh, uh, inflation, and so escalation is a is a guess about how much prices will increase over the next two years. Yeah, I just want us to actually say what it is. What it is. Is and this working? Uh, yeah. Okay. No, but to say like, no, so what are the uncertainties? I mean, you know, you, Allison just mentioned oil mm -hmm. tariffs in my left ear. Yeah. But yeah. I think I think people need to hear what's. Sure. What's creating those numbers? So we may have not been enough conservative here, considering our duration could be further out, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and tariffs and other. But the, the counter argument is, we're eventually going to have a recession. Yeah. Right. And this number will actually go <laughs> the other way for a very short sure period of time under budget. Right. Yeah. 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 Just just as a kind of a, a general principle, um, the way you deal with uncertainty is with money. <laughs> yeah, and and we're very early in the process, so there's a lot of uncertainty. So there's a lot of money set aside for the things we don't know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. right. uh, as we know more, some of that money can can go away. But but as you pointed out, you don't want to come in really optimistic and find out that the reality is you have enough money, and, and then you know it's a, it's a complete disaster. It's much better to go and say we assumed a lot of horrible things; they didn't happen, so we're in a good place, and we're able to return money, or it's not going to cost what we thought. Um, and that's how those concept how the numbers are generated. Yeah, I wanted to also address, I, I do, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was going to just say, design contingency, these numbers aren't just because, you know, they, they are based on historic evidence of when a cost estimator designs, makes a cost estimate at a feasibility phase, and then they, they follow that project through until it gets to bid, and then they say, well, I was off by 12%, and he, and he goes, I was off by 12% 100 times, so I should throw 12% in. Mm. So these numbers are based on cost estimators tracking their own ability to cost estimate mm -hmm. at a feasibility phase and then at a design. So these numbers so are very... In the process. Right. And the, the other thing that's trying to be kind of explored across a range is that if we were looking at these as totally separate projects, a renovation, an addition in renovation, and a new building, that design contingency at this phase would be different because a new building has a lot less uncertainty 
than a total renovation, and something in between is something in between. And so he's attempting, and I'm putting words in your mouth, and you sure. tell me to shut up if you want, um, but, uh, but he's attempting to, across the board, do a decent job of, of being conservative. <laughs> trying to find and, a middle ground right. between it all. That'll okay. work for everyone. And right. that's because we want it to sort of be apples to apples. Right. So it's listed as 12% for all the options. But I believe that's, that's the not, case. Yeah, yeah it is. Right. Uh, but that's not as right. as you light on something, you get further down a path. Right. So if, if we were a new building, it might be five. Yeah. And if we were a total renovation, it might be 20. Um, you know, it, it, I may, I'm kind of making numbers up, but to, to give some extremity to the to the range. <coughs> so I have to go. Have to go. Um, but I did have a comment, and now I'm forgetting it. Um, I'll remember it once I put my jacket on. Sorry. <laughs> Are we still four? Yeah. 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 My thoughts about the overall cost per square foot? Yes. She yeah. mentioned uh, MSBA cost per square foot is 475, you said? Four, it's 471 was the average. Okay. Um, so escalation would be one reason we're higher. 8% is, is going to be a big chunk of that increase just because we're escalating out further than the MSBA projects that you're looking at. Well, well those are starts. For, uh, those are starts. That was 2019. The other thing I would point out is our site cost um, is substantial on this site. We have a big site. You know, MSBA will reimburse up to a certain percentage, I believe it's 8%, and, and we're, we're way over that here, 20, 20 something percent for site cost, if I remember correctly. Um, and so that's something we could look at. What should our scope be in the site? Did we want to do all the fields? Do, you know, um, right now the site scope is itemized in the estimate, and we can go through that if you want to. That was my question. <laughs> So, uh, so I, 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 think, I, I yeah. think I know the answer to the question, yeah. but I want to make sure. So I'm assuming in the cost estimates that require the longer phasing, that that includes all the costs associated with every month that a project goes longer than it was going. So all that's the general conditions, all, all yes. that's in there. I just want to make sure. Temporary construction. Yeah. And then we have the portables for that one option, and we have an estimate for portables. So, option. But but it doesn't include anything that the school district would have to pay that move books That's twice, question, yeah. move books twice, move classrooms costs. twice, and all that well, kind of stuff. The moving costs would be in soft costs. Yeah, so, exactly. That's what. So you know, we have this big soft cost number now, so I could say, oh, we included it. Yeah. But we're trying to <laughs> find that down. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the more the more. Moving around, yeah, that's going to cost a lot. So anyway, and the staff cost wouldn't be in our project too. Exactly. That exactly. Would be part of operations. Okay. Uh, Great. Thank you. All right, thanks. So now we're down to just a bare quorum. I'm going to let Arena ask her question, and then I'm going to ask us, ask the group, who the next one to leave is, so we can gauge how much time we have left for questions before we run out. So I have questions about the site cost because I. I think as you go down on the options, it starts becoming a bigger, bigger percentage of the whole construction cost. And it's always almost the same number, even though it's very different scope of work in the new building. Yes, you have to up to everything again, because you're moving the case from side to side. It's required. Right. Yeah. And in the other ones where you're almost on the same footprint, right. um, it should not be the same cost because we're almost in the same footprint. Unless we go with geothermal, then we probably have to dig up on the whole field and we do them again. You bring up a good point. So in some of the D and E, which are primarily the same footprint, the fields stay where they are. Um, do you want to redo the fields? And there are some drainage issues with the fields now. Um, but I'm not sure that means that you want to include that scope in the study. That, um, that's part right. of the question, and I think the committee has to decide how much we do for comparison. <coughs> but I think it's considering that in DNA, &E, even it's, it's a bigger proportion, I don't have the numbers here, but I think it gets to 20% well, of the whole project cost. Right, because that same site number holds in yes. uh, the rest of the project cost. So that so may yes. or may not be the right comparison. It sounds like something we should probably set as a as a conversation for our, our next meeting is to actually look at that scope. Because a bit. even in the all of them, they have the site prep is almost a million dollars in all of them. Um, we have three million dollars in site development, um, and I think not all the projects have the same 
cost, I think they, they are different. Yeah. I, I agree. I think right now the estimator is looking at doing the whole site. And so the area of the whole site is staying the same between all the options. Now within there, you'll see they've itemized field areas differently to a certain extent as the options but show it differently. That, that's within, it's a noise, it's a noise level. It's maybe a little bit, the, right. Within the other options, I think they're $200,000 different. Yeah. Which is it, On the site yeah. development, right. where I see the first part is almost the same, yeah. and I think it's What I'm saying one. is we're doing the whole site and all the options right now, yeah. and I'm not sure that's right, and that's why I'm asking you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think How important is it to redo the fields? Like, I well, I, I, I think there's a different, uh, there's kind of a different question too, mm -hmm. is what portion of the feeds, fields are, or of the non-school building, I guess, mm -hmm. parking lot, is associated with direct school use? and what is associated with general recreational use. Right. And I, I can't imagine not including all of the playground, outdoor, recreation, gardens, space associated with the educational programming of the building. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually think we should be freighting these estimates with redoing an adult recreational softball field with lights because why on earth would you include that as a custom element or school? The town might choose to do it, but it would. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't. Yeah, but yeah. the town can choose the to do it. The town did, so we're not going to do it. Yeah. But also, it's just, it's just right. not, that's a different portion of the town budget right. that would pay for that, or the capital plan would pay for that. And so I think that's, I think that's important. Um, I'm sure you're going to do this, but I just think that reinforcing what Maria said earlier about documenting your assumptions, um, whether they're. <coughs> I, I, well, the way you explain it, I think 83% sounds perfectly reasonable. I also think you got to pick a fixed point in time because, I mean, hypothetically, this building, uh, if Michael Bloomberg gave a gift to the town, we could build it next year, right? Uh, if not, it could be seven years from now. Uh, but then the point is, if you, started, if you started inflating a hypothetical building built seven years from now, your numbers would be worthless, basically, at that point, right? Because the because the numbers of assumptions would be going into it would render the exercise useless. Um, so it needs to be some it's not something you need close enough in time so that the numbers are still meaningful and the assumptions are still meaningful far enough away that it starts feeling realistic. Like let's say it's two years from now for the sake of argument, which is I think what you did. So I think that makes sense. Documenting that makes sense. I, you know, and again, I, I guess. I'm still I'm looking for your team's best professional judgment on things like soft costs. When you tell me it could be 20% or it could be 30%, that's not a great answer to me <laughs> because that's such a huge difference, right? right. Uh, I mean, it's a massive di the difference between 20% and 30% is like completely massive. Yeah, it's um, so of just in this what it's millions of dollars in this context. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So so just getting more precision around. Whether you say, and by the way, also the other key point is, we're not looking for a, no, a low number. We're looking for the right number, right? So if you say, so if you can justify thirty, then use thirty. If you're saying twenty-five really is a better percentage, then use twenty-five. But I still think having some sort of baseline or some sort of comparable is footnote that says, you know, if you can, if you look in the industry, you'll see this and this. We use this for that reason. I think it's just extremely helpful, not just for us as a committee but also again for the end audience, because I think one of the things which is challenging about this process is, the, is the, no matter what you do in something like this, the numbers look big, right? right? And so people just need to understand where the numbers come from and have a good sense of what it's based on. And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think that's sort of it. Yeah, we intend to justify our soft costs. We'll do that. So we are at, playing a little time here, we're at 10 after 7. Um, I want to have as full of discussion as we can have while maintaining quorum. Um, what, what, are, what are we going to kick the tires on this thing next, and what do we need to get done? Well, that's, that's kind of what was my, yeah. my next breath. Um, we're probably not going to meet again until, I'm, I'm going to be conservative here and say, you know, the first or the second week of January, depending on when we can get quorum. I know you're not available the ninth, but, so but I said as well every other time. I know. <laughs> Are we trying next week? No. I, I, I just don't think we're going to make it next week. But we can try. We can do a dual poll or, or, or you can 
help us with a poll. Um, but assuming that we can't manage to pull something off for next week, it's likely to be that first week of January. Um, and so it circles back to my question I had towards the beginning was, what more do we need to give you in the way of feedback um, while also answering folks' questions? Well, I mean, I, I speak to Jesse, who's done no his work here, but um, I mean, this has all been very helpful. We, we've seen where we have some holes that we need more explain, explanatory tasks or graphics, um, and, and so we have stuff to continue to work on. And I think maybe, you know, just another session similar to this, where we continue to go through and we'll continue to probe and see areas that don't make sense or that need more explanation. Um, I mean, it's not going to be... There's no clear answer like I need you to say this, and I mean I think this has been just very helpful for us. By the way, is there a technical? And now I'm asking our, our recording uh, uh, technician a uh, technical limit to how long this is going to record. Okay. Seventeen minutes. Seventeen more minutes. Seventeen more minutes. Well, seventy. Seventy. Zero. Oh, seventy. Oh, oh, more than we'll ever possibly. possibly. Yes. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Maria. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we. I think we want to get a little more detail on, on the cost estimates. I mean, this is our first pass at it, and I think um, I think we do need to, to dig a little deeper. I, I actually, I want to come back to the, to the cost per square foot because I'm just not, it's, it's significantly higher than what I'm, than comparable things. So I, I think we just need to, to make sure we're, including what we should be and not including what we shouldn't. And I think that we need to think about um, are there things that we can be thinking about doing different in the design to affect our costs? Because are there choices that we should be thinking about making to, to affect our costs? Because it's a big ticket item. You know, I think, I think we have to talk about the elephant in the room and, and see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think for a, a feasibility study, it's just that. Is it, are, are various options feasible? Uh, you know, what, so option A, new school. Well, you know, there's an infinite number of new schools we can do, and every one of them will have a different price point. Um, and, and I don't know that there's any value in, in just doing variations of new schools to see that, yeah, they can cost anywhere from X to X. Um, and, and the same thing with these renovation options. We sort of uh, zeroed in on, on the obvious sort of conceptual options of building a vision here. There's a million ways those rooms can be reconfigured and how it could be phased and, and they'll... And, and so I, I don't know that that exercise, you're just going to get another number that's no more valid than the other number and, and so how do you pick one or the other? No, I think if I, wanna, if I could pick up a little bit of what Maria is thinking and what I ju just kind of Got my head around around the site. Are there scope pieces? I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't. I don't think Maria. This is Maria's intent. I don't want to debate uh, at the cost of the the ceiling tile. You know, or whether we should use a less and more expensive one. That, that's not a valuable exercise. Definitely way too fine grain. But if we are including larger amounts of site costs, which are going to drive up those square footages, um, then we should be conceptually. Um, or I, versus doing what we could just do around the educational program, that's something I think we want to identify and at least talk about. Um, maybe that's the only one there is, but if, if there are other ones we should be thinking about, I think we want to spend a little time to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think we just have to, you know, maybe this 550 is, is the number, but I think we need to be able to explain what are we getting for 550 that the folks who did it for 505 aren't getting. Right. You know, that's that's the kind of question I think we have to answer. What sure. Yeah, and I, and I think we can kind of go exactly benchmark sort of by by division. You know, it, how are our HVAC numbers compared to other HVAC? Are they higher? Why are they higher? Uh, you know, and look at kind of the major pieces of the cost and check them against other schools we've done and our estimators have looked at and. So, and and look at that delta and, and come up with an explanation so that we can come back and say, hey, so you are, as we've already done, so site cost is very high, so that's one that's jumped out. 
Uh, but are there other items like that? And then we can talk about why they're different and why they're causing the cost to be a little bit higher. And maybe we can adjust the scope, or you know, we understand why and, and we're good with it. Eric, to me, that's actually exactly the exercise, mm -hmm. is because I don't, um, I mean, especially if you, I guess this isn't including the soft cost, but if it's including uh, at least, you know, escalated costs and things like that. Um, I, I, I guess my point is I don't, until we walk through a sort of how these costs are composited and how benchmarking them in some way, then I wouldn't know how to even offer any feedback. I mean, we sort of, I mean, I already asked a good question, but otherwise we sort of accidentally backed into the question of what are we doing on this on this on the site and what's the scope of that work, um, which is a useful exercise. I don't think we're going to get to anything useful on this without going through the same sort of uh, exercise. And then I think I I think you know I wouldn't want to get too far into the weeds of it, but I think where you're identifying things that might be, if there is anything. That might be un you know, uh, unusually expensive. So in other words, you might say, you'd say this other school over here that is a total square foot cost, you'd think it's apples and apples, but actually if you break it down and you look at this segment and this segment as we were looking at it, in fact, actually the work that needs to be done turns out is substantially different. It affects the cost, and here's the reason why. Um, I think not only is it useful for us, but I think it's useful for um, sort of an end narrative of because it actually goes back to feasibility. We've discovered this thing about this building site or this building right. program, and here's what it looks like. I have a question. Yeah. Um, we talked about changing the baseline to be the 30 EUI building. Um, when you think about benchmarking, that will be a, another thing we'll have to adjust out of the number. And maybe that's just how we approach it. Whereas if we stick with the 50 EUI, it's going to more easily benchmark because you're going to find, I think, more 50 EUIs that we have information on. But I could be wrong. We could, we could look at that, I suppose. Um, so two things. Uh, on the site cost, I think it's very important. I was just doing the numbers. If you look at the site cost and you put the, all the contingencies, for option A, it's equivalent to $89 per square foot of the construction cost. Right. And for each option, A3 is $108 per square foot of the construction cost. So uh, those are, it's, I, don't, I know that we cannot say, okay, we don't have any side cost numbers. Okay. Right. But it accounts for a huge portion of the construction cost. And as you reduce the floor, uh, the floor print, it escalates even more. That is true. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful, and, and I think we have to tighten these numbers. Often when we're benchmarking, we often take the sites out completely and just compare building, because sites vary between every building, it's sort of the role. At the same time, in one of these cases, we're going to have to do something on the site, but maybe not everything. So Yeah, we, well, have we do what we think we need to with the site okay. and put that in. Right. But and then the other question you were asking about um, comparing to other towns. Cambridge has been building many net zero schools in the last years. Okay. Um, I think there are three huge complexes. I think all the schools now are net zero, the new ones are building. And I've seen huge complexes about 160,000 square foot and 200 square foot, they include K through six and high upper schools, pools, community centers, everything within the complex. So, that might be a way to compare numbers also. Okay. Although it's a bit of an environment. Um, we, we mentioned the pricing narrative, which members of the public might not know what we're talking about. I, I don't know if it's on the website or not. I think I've got it. Maybe I've been in there. I mean, we never really got a chance to go over that with you guys um, because we got wrapped up in the school committee presentation. Yep. And maybe th that might help to, ex help to explain um, a, a lot of our questions. It, 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 it just might be helpful to, to go to take some time to go through that, um, or if you have other suggestions. But um, I think as as much as we can de-jargonize things, <laughs> would be would be helpful so that people know, like, okay, 
But what does it mean to me to, if, when you say an EUI of, of 50 and 30? Uh, I don't know what that means to, I don't, I don't know if people can put that into something tangible and say, oh, I get it, you know. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they won't. <laughs> because it's just like, does 50, does the insulation, is the insulation horrible with 50 and it's no. good at 30? No, it's good and, you know, so I yeah. think we need to, we need to be uh, thinking about how, how to explain well, that, all of these. Yeah, I mean, things. that's that one slide that has what, that talks about the EUI of the buildings, right? And, and tells you, you know, an average school current is like EUI of 110, and then, you know, what Energy Star, high performance screen at zero. And that, that at least gives some people a reference that typical school in this climate, EUI is around 100, 110. You know, we're looking at 50, so better than you know, half that. Right, but what are other net zero buildings? Right. But, you know, what, what when, you're, when you're doing net zero, especially, particularly for the 100% the, the new construction, but for the new options as well, what, what are the ones in Cambridge? Are they 20, are they 30, where, where are they? Where are they starting? They're probably in the 30s. Yeah, I mean, I think that would, that, that would help people to. Could be more help. Oh, I think. I'm wondering if uh, do we have an outline yet for the actual final work product of the report? Because I'm wondering if things like the pricing narrative are going to end up in there, and um, kind of gives us a sense of I don't know how when we were reviewing it, like how much more that wants to be developed for something that's going to go public and as part it of it. It was a pretty lengthy document. My guess is it would go in there as a as an appendix. Yeah. You know, that wouldn't be the body that would be an executive right. summary, really. But are you really, expecting, you know, yeah. feedback on that? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Just, or you know, just like, like it is. <laughs> yeah, like at the end of the uh, the thing, we did have the um, narrative about the, the lead stuff, and I thought it, would, it felt very kind of copied from Wildwood and not actually very relevant to this project, and really kind of talked about if, you know, if the community wants to, if, wants to back away from net zero, I mean, it just kind of, had some assumptions in it that seem not really, like based on our discussion tonight. Um, I, 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 it was it was made for this project. Uh, I think the consultant was was just trying to cover all the bases. Uh, so I I don't think they were suggesting to back away from that zero in any way. It was just trying to again cover the whole game. But. Um, yeah, we've been following the MSBA structure for feasibility studies, uh, the PDP. Uh, so it would it would include um, narratives that were used to achieve the budget in um, section three or four, depending on whether you're in the PDP or PSR. But that doesn't really matter. That's been our um, our structure so far. If you want to take a look at MSBA guidelines, you could get a sense of of that. But I would think the pricing information would, would be in the report. Yeah. So that's another reason to kind of discuss it, if not only for just our understanding and how it feeds into the estimate, but, but as something that's going to end up in the final report. Um, so we started off this portion of the meeting asking like what our next things to do are, and I feel like we haven't really articulated that yet. It sounds like we're just going to come back and do this again. Is that? Well, not, not exactly. I'm, I'm hearing what I've heard in the last uh, 10 or 20 minutes is is several points for, for next time's agenda, next the next agenda, and I'm I'm going to kind of rattle them off, and people can uh, pipe in if they disagree. Um, I think we want to go through the narratives um, in, in some way just to make sure that everybody has the same general understanding of what's in it um, and ask questions about it. Um, I think we and I think that might actually engender a, a discussion about things like site scope, um, uh, and certainly site scope is something else I'd like to, to have put on that agenda. Um, and then we might do a little bit <laughs> more of this, but I think it might be in a, in a bit more focused way. I'm also going to ask, and I don't know if this is necessarily the next meeting, but at some point I think it'd be really handy to have the net zero consultant come back and. And now that we've had kind of surfaced some questions and talked a bit more, um, you know, he, he was able to kind of give us a big overview, but I think we have some more 
exacting questions asked at this point. Uh, nah, I'm speaking for myself. I, I'm curious what other other people think, but I'm I'm kind of thinking it might nice might be nice to have another conversation if that's appropriate. What folks think about that. Uh, I I like it. I mean, I think it, we we also talked about um, we ha you had that one chart where it says okay this is. The, the average, this is where we're at now, and, this, and it would go down to zero within this. But having a better sense of what the difference between um, uh, that, that you'd get with the net zero building on costs, all maybe other costs going out into the future, I think we need that to be fleshed out a little bit more. I think you were asking about that as well. Yeah, I, I have been, and I think one of the things that is a challenge in it's probably a challenge of this format is um, if we're not, if I'm not careful, speaking for myself, but it's probably true of the rest of the committee, we could pepper with you with a number of questions and a number of things that we'd like to see that may be either very hard to do or very easy to do, um, but don't, don't <coughs> necessarily productively result in a, in a more effective work product. And so, uh, part of the challenge for me is that I'm not really asking some of these questions because I want to know them like next meeting come with a slide that shows me what this information is. Yeah, I'm really more indicating something I think the final report has to include. So for and just for example, on, on that slide that goes through from 110% down to zero, um, among other things, if you really think the more illustrative um, numbers are 110 because that's current, 65%, 50% or 55%, whatever, and then zero, um, and then drop out whatever else was on there. I, it would be interesting to me, and this goes back to what Maria was asking, is understanding more what, unpacking what each one of those, or at least the, the most important ones, like 60, 55% or 50% and, and zero, what does that mean? Um, in terms of uh, the design, construction, and operating costs would be something that I, would, I think not only would be interesting for the committee, but I think a NAN report was going to be interesting to know because it really helps explain what, what's actually happening in the building, what are the implications both for the state. Does that make sense or am I asking too much? It, it, well, yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so maybe you're asking the wrong question. In terms of operating costs, we, we absolutely can tell yeah. you what those mean. And, and started to do that but when you say what does that mean in terms of the building again you know that these <coughs> are EUIs are just how much energy the building uses yeah so for any given EUI there are literally an infinite number of ways to achieve that number so it doesn't mean that you have triple glaze windows I could do it with single pane windows it just means I have to offset it different I mean yeah. and that's when I mean, you get into design we and we will model you, know, you do detailed energy models and you keep playing and changing with the pieces, uh, and there's just an infinite number of combinations, and you try and find the one that makes the most sense and get the most bang for your buck to get the lowest EUI you can get. But for us to describe what a building that gives an EUI of 40 looks like, it just it, can it's I ask not another can I, can I ask another question? Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I look at that slide, and I say to myself, I can't really picture or understand. What's what the meaningful differences are, other than I understand the difference between zero and a hundred. Uh, but uh, how would what what near, maybe you already have it? And forgive me if it's in a, a Google Drive somewhere. <laughs> but understanding how how in your experience and the experience of your colleagues, you would describe what the what the what the meaningful difference of that range of construction of alternatives is without being exhaustive. Does that make any sense? Is there a narrative way of describing how so. you achieve different ranges without being that specific? I think we've relied be. on our experience to communicate with our consultants right now because we work with these yeah. team all the time. Um, but I think we could narratively give a summary of the kinds of things that are involved. In yeah, it would be sort of Typical strategies you might employ to achieve yeah. this target. Yeah. Right. Right. I think I think what you you're trying to explain. You know, it's basically why do we care about doing a net zero building? Like, what what are what are we getting out of it? We know we're going to pay a 
something for it, right? But what do we get out of it? What's, what are the advantages? And maybe in, in ways that, that people just could understand, so like the, the, it's going to be, like saying it's going to be a triple pane window, I mean, that means something to somebody. So saying that the insulation is going to be a lot better. I think people can understand, oh, I get it. So then if I did that to my house, I wouldn't have to spend as much to heat it or cool it because it's better insulated. It might have to be just that much big picture. Yeah, so well, the tricky that's bit kind is, of what yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah I think so that's back, back to just yeah, the typical strategies you, you might move, I, I might use. I, I don't know that that tells you that they're what's better about a net zero building. Uh, triple pane windows are not what is better about a net zero building. What's better is it's it doesn't use energy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so we're not burning fuel somewhere else, and we're not you know there's not a nuclear power plant that's yeah. making your building go, um, and so. Those things are just ways to help us get to that goal. But so, so that's actually the challenge. I mean, to me, it's interesting you say that. Because conceptually, <coughs> that's the challenge for me, is, is that doing the status quo is not mentally that hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, I mean, it just isn't that hard to imagine, right? You imagine buildings you already go into, maybe newer ones, as opposed to older ones. Uh, and then even if I have, I guess I have been into a, a zero energy building, but I mean, even if I hadn't been, uh, envisioning what that looks like, if it's a zero energy building, as dumb as this may sound, because the outcome is a zero energy building, uh, almost everything you look at somehow in a way looks like magic, right? Because you've actually, I mean, I mean, being facetious, because you've obtained a zero energy building, you kind of understand all the, uh, the design and material and other things that might have gone into it. Um, what's interesting is that it's harder to imagine between those two. You know, the other thing that's going to make this a little more complicated, perhaps, for everyone's vision of, of a net zero building, is it, it used to be really, really hard to do a net zero building. Uh, it was sort of cost prohibitive because PVs were so expensive and the properties just weren't available. So. So you had to go to a lot of extreme strategies in the building to make that happen. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing in all our projects now is, is the cost of PVs is coming down so fast that it's not hard <laughs> to generate the electricity if you have the room to generate the electricity to get a building to be net zero. And, and you're going to start seeing buildings all over that net zero that look like every other building. It's like, well, what, what makes this net zero? Well, because out back there's a bunch of PVs. So it's. You know, there's an image in everybody's mind that, you know, it's an exotic building, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Um, and, and that's something and, that... And in the end, the, the end user's experience and use of the building should be the same. Because right. you really, your use of the building should be the you sh Your use of the building should not... I disagree with you, Mr. Riddle, and I'm going to do it in public. <laughs> <laughs> the same room, the same way. Because you know, you most, be, the easiest way right. to get a net zero building is to build a refrigerator. Who wants to own a refrigerator? <laughs> you know, that's that's right. the extreme version, right? So we're not building refrigerators; we're building buildings where people need to live in them um, or use them. Um, Our students should be as satisfied with the space. Yeah, I guess is what that's I'm daylight. Say. Daylighting right. is is in can be in contrast to energy usage, right? Usually, you don't get in as much daylight through that window as you give up in the heat you're throwing out the window, right? So windows are not, anyway, that's, as it, so what we're talking, so I, you know, completely believe that we can build a net zero new building. The part that I'm like, you know, you kept talking about the two, the part that I'm most interested in, in this feasibility study is we've got, you know, five options that are making use of an existing building. And for me, and I know, like in a new building, like you say, you can change the size of the windows, you can make them triple glaze, but those levers are way more constricted in the number of things that we can tweak and pull and, and change in an existing building are greatly limited. And that's to me where the kind of meat of this feasibility study is getting if, if we're going for net zero and we're going for you know, uh, daylighting and we're going for these things. It's how do we qualitatively compare a new building to these um, renovation schemes and uh, you know so far we have costs and I just really want to develop you know that that quality somehow have a way to and even if it's just a narrative from a professional that says the quality of the experience you know 
at the feasibility level, you know, we're still going to have a slab that's going to have condensation on it because we can't put a vapor barrier underneath it, you know, and we're still going to have, you know, we can't detail where the structure, you know, the buildings in the 60s were not built to really take into account thermal envelopes, so there's parts of the structure that just stick outside the thermal envelope, and so our URI is just not, our energy performance is not going to be, you know, and so somewhere in this report, somewhere I really want to be able to talk about the qualitative difference just we got the numbers and then what is the experience of these buildings and I've been very and by the way like there is so much meat in here like you guys this is just great stuff um, but that's the part that you know the end result that I really want to be able to like and I think we're all kind of getting at that like yeah, we want to vet those qualitative parts of the report with you and so perhaps that's an agenda for next time we could bring some bullet points addressing renovation versus new construction and um, different approaches to net zero, let's say, um, different EUI buildings and what the strategies would be. Um, I was hopeful like the, the lead report would start us helping with that, but maybe that's just not the right tool. It's a little um, bit ahead of where we are. We, we would have yeah. to have a lead meeting and go through it's goals in these different categories tool. that sustainability sets. And I think um, it something we'd love to do with you, but it's not the time. Right? Yeah. I, yeah, I, mean, I am going to play I, I, time I'm, keeper I'm no, I wanted to say, if we can <coughs> go back to the beginning of our meeting, talking about the uh, outreach, since now they are here, you yes. can ask them a little bit. Uh, we need to kind of form outreach form, and at some point we need the input of you guys, what are the typical of what you do? Because we, we, we can propose all those things and then you say, no, that's not the way we present. Um, so we need, because we, at this point we were thinking maybe try to attack it would be at the end of January. Um, I guess we should briefly say that we're, we're going to form a small working group to, to begin talking about this. And I, I guess the, the, the probably the most efficient thing at this hour is to say we're going to reach out to you and, 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 and talk to you about how, how, you, how you do them and, and yep. what the number we're thinking of. And just we'll get, get back to you separately on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Just because it's yeah. getting late in my meeting the outreach. If we can't <laughs> meet next week. Certainly, the the, outre the outreach group will probably try to do it. Yeah, that, yeah, but I'm wondering <clears throat> if um, if do we need to have is would it make sense to have a working group to, around cost issues as well if we're not going to meet for an extended period of time? Somehow, I would love to get through that um, that that uh, narrative, and I want to hear them talk about the narrative because yeah. I think I'll understand. I, I don't disagree with the idea of potentially having a, a small working group that, that, that surfaces some scope issues or looks at scope issues, but I want to understand that narrative better, and I think they need to guide us through that. Yeah, and yeah so I think your cost, there's two prime approach. One is the narrative, and, and you'll see things that either you like or don't out. like and right. jump out. Uh, and then, then the benchmarking thing that we talked about, we, we'll come back and say, hey, yeah. these are the things that are, are high or low. Um, and, and we can talk about it, but why that is, and, and then that also maybe cause some discussion yeah. about. So, assumptions. what do you need from us before we have that meeting? So, I'm wondering, do we need to have a working group, or do we need to, you know? Well, we're going to need I a little bit of time yeah. to generate, to do some benchmarking and identify okay. the cost deltas and why they exist. Okay. You know, why this is different than going down the road. Couple weeks anyway. Um, I, I don't think we're moving that way, but just at this stage, I would not be in favor of a working group on cost estimating. I think there's cost estimating things that concern every everyone. Probably has something to contribute there, and I I would maybe later, but not right now. I don't really think we should have a pair us down that way. Well, I'm wondering if we can bring closure to this evening. Um, and, and or soon at least. So let me ask what other questions there might be out there. Other. Um, well, I think the punchline for tonight, um, the, the, the bated breath from the public is sort of like, how much is this building going to cost? And the one well-known number that the public knows is what we voted on for the Wildwood project. And that was a $64 million price tag. And I believe that number was the, the whole 
furnish you know the one the, big, the project the, budget the, the yep. project, project budget yep. and so i just wanted to confirm i mean i know we're still it's still yep. a moving number at this point this is still just our first draft of this number but the number to compare to would be the ones on the soft cost contingency ffe et cetera. so it was this page Next one more no, I, no I, I think it's not those Part red numbers total. are project costs. I think total we should not. Cost. I think we should cannot compare to what would, that was not a net zero building. No. Does it have, no, no. Does it have the I, I don't think you're saying that we cycles. should. I think you're no. warning people not to. Yeah. Right. Okay. But I with think, with you know net zero. Well, I mean, if you compare <coughs> like the the, the, side cost the small here, addition and yeah, I mean, there's lots of the side cost here. If you compare the soft cost, goes over ten million dollars. It's a building without two cafeterias and two gyms. I mean, it's it's a yeah. different project in general, but just as far as the like, other one that had one cafeteria, one gym. But so. but you're absolutely right. It's one, a number that's order. out there that people are mm -hmm. aware of, yeah. and they're going to mentally make it go for it. It's mm -hmm. it's it's you know it's the same cost, but it's a smaller popular. Why you know it's going to the comparison is just going to happen. So you yes. just need to be able to, to and maybe it's a slide or it's just that just talks about. Why it's a different project? I think. Yeah. What, what, I, you know, Grace. Please direct your comments to the chair. Yeah. You don't yeah. start. I, I guess I'd, I'd rather, especially at this late hour, not want to start that that, that conversation, um, except to say that these are very different things to be looked at, and I would like, if we had to go there, I would want to understand all that we need to understand as part of our process long before I did that. Um, but that's that's kind of my, my parting kind of comment. I, it's not. They're not easily compared, certainly at this stage. So, other questions, comments for this evening, or shall we move to adjourn? Eric, I move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor. Thank you. There's a lot of questions. I realize. Questions are good. Yeah.